and it's doing this nice matrix spinning circle. And there we are. Okay, look at that. Um, uh, first question is uh, no, but you asked it verbally already. Um, uh, Wanda Costa, please give an overview about the use cases of the different types of RCUs. And what's the difference between RCU and SRCU, which certainly fits in there. And which user space has the inflation I recommend? All right, okay. you got some good ones here. All right, good. So I'll start, I'll take them in order. Um, the uh, different RCUs, I mean, if you'd have told me 25 years ago that there would be more than one flavor of RCU, uh, I'm not sure what I would have said, but I know I would not have believed you. I, I wouldn't have seen the need for more than one. So uh, let's go through in time order, I guess. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm, anyway, I guess I'll just, uh, I, I, what I'll do is I'll type into the matrix chat as I'm talking. And that way, uh, that way there's a record of what I've said. Oh, we got a whiteboard now. Cool. Uh, thank you. And can I do text and type at this thing somehow? Is that an option? I can do tools and I can do text. All right, look at that. So we'll go over here. So uh, initially we just had RCU, uh, as in, uh, I guess I'll do the read side things, RC read lock. And at that time it was strictly uh, non-preemptible. In fact, when the first preemptible kernel started appearing in the early 2000s, what RCU read lock did and, and recently does again is do preempt disable. And so the, the thing was, is that if you saw a CPU context switch, you knew that any previous readers that CPU might have had going have ended. And that was, that was the way it was. Uh, then what happened was that a couple of guys in, uh, in uh, uh, Norway, I think it was, uh, and I'm going to, I'll remember their names at 3 a.m. tomorrow, sorry. Uh, they they came up with a scenario where you could have networking traffic so viciously uh, intense that a uh, given CPU never got out of soft IRQ, which meant that it never scheduled, which meant that RCU never saw a grace period end. Uh, and that was, uh, so what happened was that we had RCU read BH, uh, the BH flavor of RCU. Uh, the idea there is that this version of RCU disables soft IRQ across the read side critical section. And so any point in execution where soft IRQs are enabled, you know, where you aren't in a local BH disable or you're not in a soft IRQ server, interrupts are enabled and so on, is a quiescent state. And that meant that even with a maximal networking load where you never got out of case soft IRQD, uh, it could still have quiescent states. And so there's some parts of networking that use that, again, for denial of service attack loads. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the early preemptible uh, kernels just had RC read lock disable preemption, and that was fine. Uh, if you want a few milliseconds of response time, it's great. But then uh, the Dash uh, RT project started around 2004, 2005, and those guys were looking for deep sub millisecond uh, response times. And at that point, disabling RCU across a task list walk just you know, that, that killed you right there. So uh, we needed to have preemptible RCU. I spent many months, many very depressing months, not finding solutions. Uh, uh, eventually, Esben Nielsen made a suggestion that didn't work, but uh, or it didn't work in general. It, it worked kind of in specific uh, situations. And uh, I was able to take and run with that uh, and make the first version of, of, uh, of uh, preemptible RCU. But then you still needed non-preemptible RCU because by that time, people were using synchronized RCU or synchronized kernel, it was called earlier, to wait for interrupt handlers. Uh, so uh, what ended up happening is we ended up with RCU read lock sched, uh, which could just be preempt disable or IRQ disable or whatever, local IRQ disable or whatever. Um, and so we had those three at that point uh, for those different workloads. Uh, and up to about 2006, anytime anybody said, hey, you know, I really need to block in an RC read side critical section, that was a sign to me that they really didn't understand RCU and I needed to explain it to them. Again, until 2006, when some people came up with a real use case that really made sense 
fortunately, I'd already done preemptible RCU. And so at that point, I could uh, see a way to make it work. Had they, had they given me that use case before preemptible RCU, I probably said, sorry, can't help you. But uh, that is where SRCU came from. Um, now, uh, one question is, well, wait a minute, you got preemptible RCU, you got SRCU, what's the difference? And the difference is that preemptible RCU allows only preemption, okay? Um, I mean, okay, if you acquire a, uh, a, a dash RT spin lock, non-ROS spin lock, which can sleep, uh, that counts as preemption in a strange way. It's a special case because in those cases, uh, there's priority boosting. So that means that uh, somebody uh, isn't running and the priority boosting will get them running. So it's kind of an indirect preemption, if you will. All right. Uh, all right. So SRCU, on the other hand, allows general sleeping, just sleeping any way you want. You want to wait for a network packet and wake up when the network packet arrives? Great. Go for it. Might be a while, but that's your problem. And the problem is now these the first three were global, still are. Uh, in other words, if anybody anywhere does RC read lock, then any synchronized SRC, excuse me, any synchronized RCU anywhere will wait for all of those RC read locks to find their matching outermost RC read unlock. Uh, that fails miserably with SRCU because if you got somebody that has a little algorithm and they're waiting for a network packet, they're going to have really, really, really long grace periods. I mean, by design. And if you got somebody else that only wants to wait for disk to complete, disk transfers to complete, uh, they're not going to be happy waiting for a network transfer that they don't care about. As a result, SRCU has domains. Uh, each you you create an create an initialize an SRCU struct or declare it statically. And each SRCU struct is its own thing, all right? Uh, and uh, so what happens uh, is that each of them, the readers for a given SRCU struct will delay the synchronized SRCUs for that SRCU struct and for no other one. So that's how we get away with having indefinite blocking by allowing uh, these to be gathered up into smaller chunks so that uh, somebody with long grace periods isn't inconveniencing somebody else that wants relatively short grace periods. Okay. Uh, and you could ask, I suppose, why not have domains or something for the normal RCU? And the reason is, uh, if you have a situation where, where you can do it globally, that's much more efficient. With normal RCU, if you have a whole pile of synchronized SR, excuse me, synchronized RCUs showing up at once, you can do one grace period, a single grace period calculation, and satisfy them all. And that means the overhead of that grace period calculation gets amortized over all of those synchronized RCUs. And this is not subtle. Uh, it is really, really easy uh, with a modest machine to end up with, with thousands of update requests, either call RCU or synchronized RCU or, or uh, synchronized RCU expedited, uh, for thousands of them to be satisfied with a single grace period computation which amortizes the overhead of the grace period computation down to really close to zero and really helps the efficiency. Okay, so we got four of them so far. Uh, the next one, um, oh, this isn't very helpful. I wonder if I can make this a different size. Well, I'm not gonna worry about it. I'll just start another box. So there. Okay. Uh, and the next one, I, I, I messed up by having having readers. What I'll do is I'll put, I'll put uh, what will I put? Voluntary schedule, I guess. In other words, you you weren't preempted; you scheduled, and that is uh, though that is a quiescent state. It delimits the reader in both cases. This was something that Stephen Ross had asked for, and it's used for tracing. Uh, they have trampolines. And uh, the trampolines can, uh, uh, they can uh, be preempted, but they aren't supposed to have anything inside of them or anything they call that could voluntarily schedule, okay? Uh, and so what happens is they, when they want to get rid of a trampoline because somebody removed a trace point, they update the binary so it no longer calls the trampoline they wait for a uh, synchronized 
RCU tasks to complete, or they use call RCU task, whichever. Uh, then at that point, they know that all execution that might have been in that trampoline are going to return to that trampoline sometime in the future is complete, um, and then the grace period ends. Uh, these can have long grace periods, um, uh, you know, seconds. Uh, there's been some work to make them shorter by default in the normal case, but um, they can take a while, and that's supposed to be okay. All right. Um, then uh, uh, the BPF, the next one was for the BPF guys. They needed to be able to uh, attach helpers to both ends of a function that sleeps. A very few of them, that they're whitelisted. They have just a few that can do that. And uh, uh, RCU tasks didn't work for them, the voluntary schedule as aspect. Uh, and none of the other ones. SRCU would work, sort of, but the overhead was excessive. Uh, BPF needs to be able to place itself in really, really high uh, performance pieces of the kernel on fast paths. And the extra pair of memory barriers that SRCU has just meant it was out of the running. So we ended up with something that's kind of sort of like SRCU, but doesn't have the memory barriers. And that is uh, RC read lock tasks. That, that's quite recent. That was put in in uh, 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 last year, actually. There was a another piece of the, you see, the problem with the voluntary schedule of tasks is it doesn't catch idle tasks. And so what the, uh, and so what ended up happening in tracing is they had interesting combinations of SRCU and the RCU task voluntary schedule trick. And they also would go and just IPI all the C, or excuse me, they would also do, go and force a schedule on all the CPUs. Um, and so they, they ended, that ended up, that ended up being open coded in several places. The thing saying, okay, run a task on each CPU. Um, and this isn't like run the task on each CPU in turn. It's like for each CPU, wake up a task. And then when each of those tasks is run, wake me up. And that is, uh, uh, so that ends up being a preemption, I guess, uh, schedule anyway, however you schedule. And this is uh, RCU, RCU task rude. Uh, rude because it messes with all the CPUs, idle or not. Uh, there are also some ad other ad hoc uses of RCU. You can uh, make use of uh, work queues in an RC-like fashion. There's a few places that do that. Um, and I'm probably forgetting something, but these are the, oh, there's also a trivial RCU that's only an RCU torture, but I don't really count that because it's just there to, to verify my slides, not to verify anything that anybody uses in the kernel. All right, so uh, those, are, those are seven. Uh, there's probably some other things that act like R RCU, but that's a start. Um, so uh, Vonder or Wander, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Uh, does that cover it, or is there, is, was there something specific you were looking for that I missed? Okay, great. Um, uh, glad that was helpful. Um, and then uh, 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 go, go, uh, uh, Ren, whose name I just mangled. Uh, does does that uh, did that explain the SRCU RCU difference, or would you like me to dig more deeply into that? If you want me to dig more deeply, uh, uh, a more specific question would be helpful. Uh, while that's uh, while we're doing that, I'll go ahead to Nur Hussain's question about uh, which. Uh, great. Okay. Thank you. Glad it helped. Uh, about which uh, user space RCU implementation to recommend? Uh, it depends. There's actually a lot of them by now. Uh, there is the one that Matthew and I, uh, and Matthew's the main maintainer of it in uh, user space RCU, and that one's good and sufficient. Uh, it could use some help. Uh, there's some things on my list to do to it for quite some time, uh, mostly involving automatic uh, update size scalability and performance, but it works and there's very number of projects that use it, and it's been very heavily tested. Uh, there's also one in, the, in Facebook's Folly library that seems to work fine. Uh, it's C++ rather than C. There's um, Concurrency Toolkit, I believe is the name of it. There's a couple of other toolkits that have uh, variants of RCU. They often call them EBR, or Epoch-Based Reclamation, which is a particular implementation of, of RCU. You have to be a little careful with EBR. The original paper uh, presenting EBR as part of uh, software transactional memory had a bug. 
uh, where uh, it could get in trouble with preemption at the wrong place. But uh, the ones I've looked at have fixed that bug, so they should be fine too. So uh, the first question is what language are you using? If you're using a garbage collected language, you have RC already in the garbage collector. You're set, no problem. Um, if you're using C, uh, probably the uh, Matthew Daniel's user space library is probably the best thing for you. Uh, uh, and that's in most distros in any case as well. If you're using C++, uh, the Folly library, and there's a few other ones that are C++, I don't, but I don't have a really good um, way of uh, telling you which one you should, what you should do. And, uh, oh, uh, so I have to do something. It, okay, so somebody told me that I'm, they're not seeing the updates. Apparently I have to click somewhere else to make the typing appear. Did that help, Claudio? Uh, if not, let me know. Sorry. Uh, I guess the, the trick is to type each one and then do another text window and type the next one. Okay, great. Um, all right. So uh, that's what I can tell you. Uh, actually, what would be really cool is if somebody would go try them all and actually write something up. I'm, I'm probably not going to get to that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's something that I would, uh, in the perfect world, I would do, but um, there's only one of me and uh, there's a lot of demands of my time. So it'd be really cool if somebody would just go find them all, uh, test them on various things and, you know, give an overview of what does, which does which and which is worse better in which situation. Uh, different situations, obviously different languages I've mentioned. Uh, there are also different trade-offs between uh, scalability, uh, whether you care more about readers, about updaters, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, uh, Yun Levy, uh, would you please share experiences about debugging memory barrier problems with ARCU? Oof, uh, there'd be a lot of those. Um, what I tend to do is be very conservative. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna use heavier memory barriers and then weaken them carefully. And I'm gonna use uh, uh, things like Linux kernel memory model uh, for design to try to see if I've got something reasonable. For example, um, I recently, it turned out it wasn't something that, it, it turned out it didn't actually make things faster. Uh, there's, RCU has hooks in the idle entry and exit code. And what those do is they increment a counter, uh, they increment going in, they increment coming out, and that, that allows RCU to easily determine if some other CPU is idle. That's important. Because if you have an embedded processor, especially if you have a battery powered embedded processor, it's considered extremely impolite to wake a CPU up unless you seriously have something that it needs to do. And it needs to do, not some other CPU that's already awake, can't do. And so um, doing something, how are you doing something like saying, hey, CPU five, um, are you going to quest the state? The CPU getting woken up, powered up, and burning a bunch of power, and then saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing anything, and then going away is. Uh, uh, not a good thing. Uh, you can burn a surprisingly large fraction of the battery doing that sort of thing. Uh, and in fact, in the early 2000s, uh, I was working on, I, I had the one of the early prototypes of Dynetic Idle uh, implementation RCU. And it, what it would do is it would kind of run through the rest of the state machine. So it would invoke all the callbacks in that CPU and then let the CPU go completely idle, shut down the scheduling clock interrupt. So what would happen, a uh, CPU would go idle, it'd be a few more scheduling clock interrupts, and then it'd be fully idle. So, you know, what's the problem, right? Well, um, the people that were inconvenienced by that, uh, flaming me on Linux kernel mailing list was not sufficient. They called me on the phone and they yelled at me. I'm, I kid you not. I, the phone rang, I picked it up, and there were people screaming at me for these extra scheduling clock interrupts. It turned out that those were worth 30 or 40 percent of their battery lifetime. And getting rid of those uh, helped them out quite a bit. Uh, so, uh, of course, idle entry and exit is important. And we were asking about memory barriers. And the thing is, is that you have to sample this counter off CPU. I mean, the whole point is that the CPU goes idle and RCU doesn't make it do anything. And so that means some other CPU has to safely be able to sense that CPU state, keeping in mind the CPU could wake up at any time. It could get an interrupt. It could get a wake up, uh, anything could happen. A timer might go off. Um, and that means that you can't just kind of guess, it has to be very carefully synchronized. Um, and uh, so uh, weakening those memory barriers, right? Initially, it, it was just an atomic increment. 
uh, it has been for a long time because there was a feature that uh, the MM guys thought they needed, but turned out they didn't. And so there were some extra bits and some potential uh, updates. But it turned out they weren't using that, and they weren't. And so I and so Joel Fernandez invented a patch to remove it. I eventually applied that, and at that point, it's updated only by its own CPU. And at that point, you don't need an atomic increment; you can just increment it. Uh, but you need full memory barriers, and, and uh, so I used the Linux kernel memory model to prove that I only needed a memory barrier on one side and not the other. I could use a store release and a load acquire to get the ordering in the other direction. Uh, Frederick Weisbecker believes that I can get rid of one of the remaining uh, memory barriers, and he might be right, but he's going to have to prove it to me. Uh, but the problem was, so so what happened is you have a non-atomic increment and a full memory barrier, SVMB. The problem was that a uh, full memory barrier on x86 is, guess what? It's an atomic increment. And that meant that by making it more efficient, I was actually making it less efficient on x86. Uh, Linus noted that and says, you know, I'm not taking that patch. Uh, we were still able to uh, get some reduction in overhead on the read side. So we got something anyway. Uh, but uh, it's an open question whether I can make that more aggressive. Uh, uh, reduce it. So uh, to tie that back around, uh, the what I try to do is avoid debugging. I try really, really hard to avoid debugging memory barrier problems. And the way I do that is I use stronger memory barriers unless I can absolutely prove I use weaker ones. And I do the initial debugging with the stronger ones and uh, uh, weaken them very carefully afterwards. The reason for that is it's really easy to make a design where you have a weaker memory barrier. And then later on in the middle of debugging, realize your design wasn't quite right. So you adjust your design and do something really simple that means, hey, wait, no, I need stronger memory barriers there and not realize it, okay? So it's better to get the thing working and then weaken than to try to weaken to start with, unless you've got something that's so straightforward that you just use, for example, store release and load acquire and know you're good. So that's one example, um, uh, maybe not quite what you're looking for, but, uh, but that is my advice. If you're doing code that is lockless, use the strong synchronization first and weaken it carefully. And the reason is you do not want to be debugging uh, ordering and your algorithm at the same time. So debug your algorithm thoroughly and then do the ordering. It's good. Now, don't get me wrong. You want to think about the ordering ahead of time. Because if you wait until afterwards to think about the ordering, you've probably designed yourself out of the weaker models. But uh, be careful. Um, you know, stick with the full memory barrier and, and perhaps and uh, load acquire and store release in, in ca cases where they work straightforwardly, okay, where you're just communicating from one to another. That's my advice. Uh, there's probably better ways to do it, but, uh, you know, we've all got something to learn, right? So Dimitri asks, uh, do you have any ideas how RCU can be improved during extended or any future work ideas for RCU? Actually, I've got a list that's kind of long. Um, there's a fair number of things involving uh, RCU torture, for example. Uh, in fact, there was a suggestion yesterday that I uh, have some way of overcommitting CPUs to uh, more aggressively turn out bugs. That might be a good idea, might not, but you know, it's worth thinking about. I should add it to the list. Uh, there are any number of uh, uh, things. To, for, for example, right now, uh, in parental RCU, uh, RCU relock and RCU unlock involve a real function call. Uh, there's really a call involved. Whereas in non preemptive RCU, it's 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 an inline function, a static inline function. So uh, there's no function call instruction. Uh, Lai Zhangshan, some years ago, uh, gave some patches, a patch series that got it to where on x86 it could be a um, also an inline function. The, the reason that it's hard to make it an inline function right now is that it access the accesses a field in the task structure. And the task structure uh, isn't available everywhere. And if you try to make it available everywhere, you end up with all sorts of problems with in, include file uh, cycles and, and issues. Uh, what, uh, uh, what Lai Zhangshan did was uh, uh, kind of a clever trick involving making it so that uh, 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 it didn't have to live in the task structure. But that also had the effect of having some more stuff happening on context switch. So at some point I need to take the scheduling guys aside and say, yeah, come on, uh, 
uh, you know, I haven't heard complaints, uh, specific complaints about people, um, aside from Lai Zhang Shan sending the patch, uh, saying they're running into problems with uh, overhead on that side. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic because, I mean, you got an extra function call, I can't be free. Uh, Linus one time complained about it, but it turned out that that was a problem with his measurement, and he so he retracted the bug report uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but uh, at this point, uh, there is an overhead. Uh, one of the things I've been toying with for a long time, um, in fact, there was a patch, uh, I might have been submitted, I can't remember who submitted, it might have been me, uh, where I just, we just uh, had a build step that uh, calculated the offset in the task structure and made that available uh, elsewise. And people got rather upset with that uh, with that trickery, but uh, that would have the nice effect of not requiring the schedule to do anything extra, and allowing us to have inline uh, uh, functions. So uh, that's a couple of examples. There are a lot of things like that. Uh, let's see. If I, well, let me let me just uh, take a quick look here. Uh, see if there's anything anything of uh, interest on my list. Um, let's see here. Uh, Lock torture could use some help. Uh, there's some a uh, bunch of things on KV free that uh, that Vlad is working on. Uh, uh, Miraj and I have been have been going through uh, task trace RC, which is fairly new. Uh, he found uh, he found some bugs and and provided some fixes as as did I. So that should make that better. That's just debugging though. Um, one question I have for you guys: There's this thing called config from fast no hertz. All the places I know of where people use it, it's useless. Okay, what? So what's config net fast no hertz? What it is 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 a thing that allows you to um, enter idle more quickly. Okay, uh, and uh, but and so embedded people uh, have liked it and used it, except that all the embedded people I know that use it right now also offload all their callbacks. Well, if your callbacks are all offloaded, fast no hertz is doing nothing for you. It's adding overhead to the idle transition. You know, it's, it's, it's adding a check. Hey, am I offloaded? Yep, I am. Okay, don't do anything. Uh, so from what I know right now, I should remove uh, config RCU fast no hertz. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna type that because I think that's important. Um, and one of the I've had on my list for a while, and I just haven't gotten to it. I'm going to submit a patch that removes it, and if nobody complains, it's gone. Uh, so far, all the people that I've know have been using it have been using it in a way that isn't useful. So that's that's one. Uh, so thank you. That that was something I should have mentioned to begin with, just because I'm curious. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, one uh, one possibility that's been batted back and forth. I don't know if we'll do it. Right now, uh, I mentioned that RCU can remotely sense whether a CPU is idle. A CPU can be idle from an RCU pers perspective in two ways. It can be in the idle loop, deep in the idle loop, with Peter's changes of a year or so ago, or it can be in no hertz full user space mode. In other words, there's only one task. It's in user mode. Nothing else is happening on that CPU, and so there's no RCU happening either, and we don't want to interrupt the CPU. Uh, and right now, there's those look the same from RCU's viewpoint. Uh, should they look different? And there's some possibility that some parts of the kernel could use an indication uh, of whether you're in no hertz full in one uh, user space in one on the one hand, or deep in the idle loop in the other. So that's another possibility. Uh, there's, uh, as I said, a bunch of testing things. Uh, there's one of the things that I've been working on for a while, uh, and I've made some progress, but more is needed, and that's dealing with cases where uh, callbacks are flooded. Uh, oh, and uh, to Shaquille's answer, it's uh, uh, RCU fast no hertz, but you need config in front of it. Uh, config won't fit, so there you are. Uh, but yes, please check. You know, uh, if somebody's using it and they need it, I shouldn't remove it. But if nobody's using it, let's make it simpler, right? Anyway, uh, there's some really simple ways you can flood callbacks. One is just have a loop in user space where you open a file and close it immediately in a tight loop. Uh, and every pass of the loop generates an RCU callback. You can generate a rather large number of them. Uh, and RCU can keep up with that. 
but uh, there's a possibility of other things. Now, uh, if you do that inside the kernel, I'm going to tell you not to do it. But user space does what user space does. And if you're doing it in the kernel, come on, put a, uh, a uh, con resket or something in that loop so that we have a chance. Thank you. So that's that's a few things. Um, if uh, if you're interested, I could I can uh, uh, make a, a more complete list. And a lot of it's speculative. You know, I, I get an idea, I write it down, and it may be maybe that I just never do it. It may be that it's suddenly becomes really important, and I do it, or uh, I may do it because I'm because I think it's cool or something. I don't know. I try. I'm less inclined to use the last reason that I get older for some reason. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Kumar, what do you think of the new user interrupts in XA6? Send you, you send you send you IPI in the context of signal M barrier based uh, URC flavors. You know that's really a question for Matthew, and he's on this call, so if he's up for it, I'd ask him to answer. Matthew, you you willing to take that on? Uh, can you just restate the question? Which one is it? Uh, the question is, what do you think of the new user interrupts in X86? Send you IPI in the context of signal mem barrier based URCU flavors? Uh, I'd, ha I'd have to look uh, more in details into it to have an informed opinion. Okay, uh, same here. Uh, but uh, 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 Kumar, could you send uh, uh, Matthew and myself an email uh, pointing us, uh, describing what you think, how you think it might be useful? Uh, and the question, uh, Shaquille, is it's uh, Kumar Kart uh, Kartikeya uh, Duvidi, whose name I probably just mangled, uh, the, the green K. Uh, well, maybe different colors, different people. Uh, the guy that just, just said sure down here. Uh, thank you, Kumar. I look forward to the email. Uh, and that's where the question is. Okay, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. And uh, we see on Matthew responding, uh, saying it's recently improved. So if you do a test, if somebody does a test comparing things, please make sure you talk to Matthew and make sure you're getting the, the latest and greatest stuff. Um, you know, rather than just grabbing whatever your distro might happen to have, which could be quite old. Uh, Matthew also noted that there's a C API, but it can use C++, and that's great. Uh, the difference, uh, what Folly is, is actually integrated in C++, so it knows about templates. So you can, uh, so instead of just having a, so instead of having an RCU struct you put in your structure, you inherit from, uh, I can't remember the name in Folly library, and the C standard is RCU obj base. Um, why that makes a difference is an interesting question, but, but there you have it. Okay, Matthew asks about an extension, uh, RCU lock, kmalloc, GPF kernel, if uh, RCU needs to require a lock. Okay, um, well, if you, okay, so if you, if you do, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying there, Matthew. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you very literally initially and then tell me where I went wrong. If you do RCU read lock, then kmalloc had better say GPF atomic because we don't, we don't block. So um, right. help so me out. So, so, so what, what I'm asking for here is the ability to automatically drop the RCU read lock. So I, it wouldn't you, you wouldn't want to just call RCU read lock. You'd want to call RCU read lock auto drop is okay, um, and then generally when you call kmalloc, you don't need to drop the lock. Um, but we 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 do all these games right now where, where, where we either allocate memory up front when we won't necessarily need to, to actually use it or we use GFP atomic when actually it'd be fine to sleep but we don't have the we don't want to write the code to uh yeah it's it's it's, it's awkward right um so I want to say it's okay to automatically drop the RCU read lock, I will check before I do anything else that was being protected by the RCU read lock. Hmm. Okay, so um, I'm a little concerned about this because I see it as a potential way of generating all sorts of bugs. Um, is uh, hmm. So I think there'd have to be a lot of work on how to make something that uh, that would be safe. In this case, I'll throw out a possibility that I don't like, but uh, maybe it'll. I mean, well, well, first off, I'll start off with one I do like, which is okay, we'll uh, explicitly get out of the read side critical section when calling came out, like me back in, and then know when you're designed that that's what you're doing. Um, 
the thing I'm concerned about is that some guy uh, does a retry critical section, calls something that does this, where he needs the and he needs the critical section to extend over there, and he he uh, passed the wrong GPF flags. I want him to yell that, right? And he probably does too, right? I mean, it's a lot better getting. Uh, I mean, it's really irritating getting uh, locked up complaints out of RCU, but it's, in my opinion, a lot more irritating to have a really weird RCU bug where your stuff's getting freed out from under you. Um, so how can we? Um, okay, so what you said was you wanted an RCU lock um, we can drop out momentarily. Uh, the thing I'm concerned about is that you usually, in that case, would have specific areas where it was okay to drop out. Um, and then how do you tell whether you're in one of those areas? Uh, the way I like is to say RC read unlock. RC read unlock is pretty cheap, and so is RC read lock. Uh, they're they're, they're um, in, especially in uh, non preemptible kernels, they're, um, you know, they don't admit instru instructions. I mean, they constrain the compiler uh, thanks to device drivers and page faults, but uh, they're pretty cheap. So why not just get out and come back in? Yeah, you know, unconditionally. We got a five minute warning because we got some other people coming up. Uh, so why don't we, why don't we, uh, uh, I think what we need Matthew is more than we're gonna be able to discuss in five minutes. Yeah, I, I think right. what, I, I think we need to discuss and look at an actual use case and see what, what works best in that case. I, I'll, I'll tell you I'm skeptical, but you know, I've been skeptical. I was skeptical of SRCU to start with too. So who knows, right? All right, right. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Uh, Goren, uh, is RCU torture testing CPU memory consistency enough for RCU RTL back black box testing? What's the suggestion on memory consisting by Linux test? Kate Litmus, lock, RCU torture, lock torture. Huh. Um, so let me restate what I think the question is. I think what you're asking is, hey, I'm making a new CPU. Um, what do I do to make sure that I've got the, that I don't have hardware errors in the memory ordering? Is that is that fair, or am I on the wrong track? Yeah, the, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's what I asked, and uh, I want to uh, you you know the uh, the CPU RTL design they will have a DV uh, design progress and uh, uh, just uh, uh, proved by the RTL code by the hardware engineer by themselves. But uh, when they uh, integrate the whole CPU to us, we will test. And uh, firstly, we will check the uh, the memory consistency is right or not. And second, we will to check uh, check that the stable uh, or, or or one a uh, 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 strong a uh, uh, high pressure uh, on the CPU running. Uh, for some lockless and uh, and a lot of acquire release uh, spin lock uh, gathering together and uh, and we have to see the CPU would uh, cause some problem or not. Okay. Yeah. So so uh, you mentioned K litmus and uh, Bouchon uh, seconded that. Uh, however, to your point, you raised about a uh, uh, high load. I suggest you run K litmus with a heavy background load as well. Okay. So K Litmus, um, K Litmus is a facility, uh, and Litmus, just straight Litmus. Uh, K Litmus creates kernel modules which run in kernel space. Uh, there's also Litmus Seven in the Herd Tools toolbox, um, and I'll type that. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay, great. Yeah, I know K Litmus. Litmus just uh, no, uh, but not K Litmus, but also just Litmus by itself. Okay, yeah. and uh, 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 we got a three-minute warning. Thank you, James. Uh, and uh, the thing you have to worry about is uh, making sure that you have the right set of litmus tests. Um, what I, I I know some people that do this. They may or may not will, be willing to talk to you. What I can do: send me an email, and I will contact them. Uh, and also tell me if you can what CPU you're working on. That may make a difference. And I'll contact them and see if they're willing to talk to you. I can't make any promises, but I can I can promise to I can promise to reach out to people who do that and have done that for years, using using tools like Litmus. Okay, and uh, perhaps that'll help. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, okay. If that I, works I for you, send send me an email. 
Okay. Okay. All right. So Let's see here. Main problem: URCU applications are not making progress. Uh, yeah, Dimitri, that is a problem, uh, and there, and that's the reason there's multiple flavors of user space RCU. Uh, and fortunately, there's been some uh, uh, progress that Matthew would be better able to talk to, but we don't have time. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, makes that less of a problem. Um, and then, uh, uh, Claudia, you've got a good question. I, I do not have time to answer it. I'm sorry. Send me an email and we'll go from there. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I can't talk about non-determinism in one minute. <laughs> uh, so with that, I think we're good, done here. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions and comments. Uh, and so I've had several people to get back to me. Uh, and uh, let's uh, keep the contact conversation going via email and other things. Thank you all very much and have a great rest of the conference. And thank you, James. Okay, next up is Liam Howlett. Do you have any presentation materials or shall I just leave the whiteboard up? I can clear it. It would uh, actually see. help if you were in the room. Matthew, yeah, can you get no, I'm here. Yeah, uh, okay. no, just clear the whiteboard. I don't have anything to present. Thank you. Uh, I, yes. uh, so I wanted to go over, uh, schedule this because it's, uh, I guess, LFS and stuff canceled and all, and we don't really have much time. Uh, to talk about uh, the VMA life cycle um, and uh, where we want to kind of want to drive this sort of thing. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, questions about how we're going to handle locking uh, with the maple tree and and there's also the speculative page fault uh, stuff that uh, Michelle's been working on. I hope Michelle's here. Um, scrolling through. Yeah. Um, I move on. All right, great. Uh, so I just wanted to I just wanted to have something uh, where we can discuss kind of kind of the overview of, of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to go about it. Um, so so the main the main purpose is we want to get rid of that lock contention in uh, in the MF lock. Um, so I, I did have a talk a couple of days ago, uh, uh, brief as it was. Um, but uh, basically, basically what, what we were looking at uh, trying to do is, is to take things to get an RCU tree in to, to track the VMAs. And then when we get the VMAs tracked in an RCU tree, we can start pulling out uh, readers uh, from, from the MF lock and, and slowly remove things uh, so that it's no longer uh, such a big contention. Uh, for this to to work, uh, the VMA lifecycle kind of has to has to be shifted from from what we have now. Uh, it, for people who are not familiar with with what what it does, um, the the VMAs they kind of live for a long time, um, and and what what we see libraries doing is is they basically they map everything and then they just kind of chunk it up. Uh, but when they when they get split up. Um, uh, the, the the VMA that was originally the big one will eventually become a smaller one by the fact that every time they split it, they keep uh, we, we we keep it around, um, and we kind of have to get rid of the RB tree uh, for for RCU to work because the uh, the RB tree um, can't be updated in an RCU free way uh, uh, RCU safe way. Um, and that's because the way the way that the uh, the way that the tree works um, is that to update the tree first you must remove the VMA uh, from the tree and then re-add it. And in doing so, you will you you can't be I mean your your readers um, kind of pose there because uh, they'll they'll not see what you're they're looking for. So we, we need a way that we can uh, juggle the VMAs around uh, so that we can um, allow readers to always see at least a consistent, if, if not consistent, but a detectable way to tell them to restart. 
Uh, and so what we've been uh, throwing around is this idea of VMAs cannot shrink. They always grow. So if you have a reader that's there and they take a VMA, as long as the VMA is still around, uh, then you know that the area that the VMA covered is at least still covered by what it, what it, it took the page file for, whatever, what, whatever reason the reader has the VMA for. Um, so that was one of the things. And then the other things, we wanted to make the VMAs freeable. And we came to the conclusion that if we do this, um, then with the other locks in play, what are the other locks? I had it on my... Uh, the file lock IM app, I believe, and the anonymous mess. <laughs> the very complicated anonymous tree. Um, so those two locks, um, when, when the VMAs are being changed, uh, the first thing that happens is the uh, MMAP lock is taken, and then the other locks are taken and the VMA is taken out of those trees as well. I believe those are interval trees, right? Uh, yes. At least one of them is. I'm not sure about the, the anonymous. Yeah, yeah, you changed them both, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the, when, we're, when we're trying to figure this out, we, we looked at how that's happening. We said, well, we need a way to tell the readers um, that there's something going on here. So they find their VMA and they're going to, they, they want to use it or whatever. Then how do we, how do we stop them from, from doing something, uh, something that, that'll cause a problem. And we, we kind of thought we'd, we'd add a flag, a VMA flag, which there was very little space for, but now there is. So that's great. So we were talking about, uh, basically an inactive flag. Um, so if you're going to be changing the VMA or whatever, you can you can flag it as inactive, and then as readers come down, they see the inactive flag, they they'll restart uh, until it's done. It shouldn't be a long time. They could uh, busy wait or they could reschedule themselves depending on the reader. Uh, so that's kind of what we we're looking at, and uh, that's sort of what I was trying to get at, hoping to get at in my talk uh, before I. Uh, or there was technical difficulties, and uh, we kind of ran out of time anyways. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about here. Uh, and and the other thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, Michelle, how, how this fits into your uh, SPF uh, work. Right. And if, if, it, if we can land it in a way that um, we don't make a huge change in the same area um, very close to each other. So, yeah, th there are different problems there. Um, if you go about the program of RMAP updates, um, we do have the program that to update RMAP. RMAP also cares about merging address on VMAs and that sort of stuff. And that right now that's done atomically with the work on the arbitrary. So um, I think in the end you will need. I think in the end you do need that sort of uh, atomicity of updating the two together, which means you need a lock that protects both. And I think that lock cannot be a spin lock because our map uses sleeping locks, and so so I think you still end up needing something like the map lock around it all somehow. Um, so how does uh, the RMAP locks, uh, when we when we get into the, um, So how does it work today? Today we take the MMAP lock, we go and we find our VMA. Um, how does how does our map do it? So um, MMAP piggy. So right now we take the um, RMAP lock, we update the VMAs for the current address space. 
looking them up in the RB3. And they, whenever right. we update one VMA we found in the RB3, we update the corresponding information in RMAP because so the did. VMAs are also in RMAP. So but if it gets we merge taken two, out, right? It's taken out of that tree uh, for the update. Yeah, you have like the RMAP. So RMAP is the anon VMA, and you have there's an anon VMA pre and post, right? And one takes it out, and then the other one takes it in, so you, or puts it back in. So you take it out of the tree, uh, and you take any of the VMAs out of that tree that are going to be affected, uh, and then you you re-add them later, right? I so, do not remember the implementation details, but uh, what it comes down to is if, for example, uh, we split a VMA or we merge with an adjacent VMA. So we look in the current address space what we do with these VMAs, right? We might do splitting, merging, and all these VMAs we touch, we uh, update in the in their corresponding arbitrary. Yes, we probably take them off and put them back, but that's kind of a detail. Um, yeah, no, but but you take them out of the other tree. The, it's taken out of the RMAP as well, right? Yes. Right. So when you take them out, how is that? What happens if someone is searching for that while it's out? Is it is it's contended on the MF sem? They won't see it because we only take them out while having the the proper RMAP lock. Like there's a there's a couple RMAP locks depending if it's a, a nanon VMA or a file or whatever. But we we, we so. They won't see it. If there's a lookup, they will they will use the corresponding lock and they will not see or tamper a state where we removed it, which is why I like I, I see it as a complete implementation detail. Well, so if they won't see it, so I, I'm failing. What they problem. will see is that so before in our map, maybe we had two VMAs. And if we merge them after in our map, we have one VMA. Yes. Uh, and that's the update we need to do. So if we make, if we try to protect uh, VMAs only with the maple tree lock, uh, which would be a spin lock, we can't update our map at the same time under that lock because RMAP, you know, ha because to update RMAP, we need to take the RMAP locks, which are sleeping locks. And so we end up having to do this work of saying, well, now we had one VMA and now we have two. And how do we find out that we have two if we broke the atomicity uh, with regard to the VMA tree update, like, you know, to the RP tree update or map tree update, whatever. Okay, so you have I, I don't I, I still don't see the race. Um, so in the VMA tree, let's just pretend we we merge two VMAs, okay? Okay. So in the VMA tree, it's easy to see because we we see the next VMA is adjacent to us, so it's really like the next VMA in the tree, and that's where we find it and we merge it. In our map, they will not be adjacent because we there's um, there's multiple address space, you know, that uh, like for, for that file uh, in our map. So they, 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 they will not be adjacent entries in the our map interval tree. And so right now, the only way we find that these two VMAs are no one is because we did the work in the VMA tree. Okay. I don't really. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know enough about the the R map to to say whether or not that's uh, whether or not we can get around 
right. around that. Um, Um, okay. <laughs> you have to look into it, I guess. Um, the way that, the way that I saw it working was, uh, the, uh, the lookup in the RMAP tree of, okay, so the VMA would be marked as inactive, uh, so you know something is happening. Um, it gets taken out of the RMAP, uh, any, uh, or the, yeah, the RMAP, uh, for the pre update. Um, and we do our work on the VMA and then we, we reinsert it. If you're going to be merging, then you have to take them all, those out as well of the RMAP tree, um, and, and do the same VMA work. Um, so I don't, I don't see a problem with the locking, uh, but maybe there's a race somewhere. Because basically you would you would you would change the VMAs as inactive, which doesn't need a lock. Then you would go and you would take the VMAs out of out of the one tree and you would you would do your up you would you would make a new VMA, put it back into the VMA tree and then back into the RMAP tree. And you're saying that won't work because of um, I'm I'm not really sure how, why you're saying well, that won't work. So right now, RMAP doesn't have these uh, inactive VMAs or anything, right? So right now, people like if you if you do well anything that goes through RMAP, right? It will take a look and uh, find what's in RMAP for a given address, and and it's sleepable, so a retry won't work. That what you're and it's sleepable. Uh, I don't know if a retry would work, but it will up. Okay, so that's that's definitely something we'd have to look into uh, to make sure that retries on um, RMAP for sure. And and that's not somewhere we've gotten to yet on uh, on the non-shrinkable VMA front. Um, essentially. What what we're looking to do is is reverse the locking, uh, so that uh, first of all readers no longer take the MF lock at all, um, and second of all the writers that need to write to the VMA tree take the lock for a much shorter amount of time, and that would be in that update window where we create the VMAs and just write it in to our tree, just swap, swapping it in, so that basically the R, the R maps locks are before uh, the the VMA lock and since the readers are already out of the way the VMA lock uh, would be only contended on writers only so I feel like that would be um, it, it would greatly reduce the time spent writing to the tree um, so basically what what we're trying to do with the VMA life cycle is, is change it from constantly having it and splitting it up to uh, just creating new ones if you're going to make smaller VMAs. Um, and readers uh, that need to sleep so could potentially sleep as well. The thing is, when you do that, it's not just a change that's local to the VMA tree. Like the if you're going to recycle your VMAs that way and, you know, get rid of the old one, put a new one instead, you have to do the same change in the RMAP tree. And so that's, uh, that makes it a bit complicated. Okay, so what about the RMAP tree do you need to do that for? How does the RMAP tree function differently? I mean, they, they come... They, it it comes out of the tree already now, right? Like it, it, there's a pre update that that pulls it out, and then you put it back in after you did the change. So, what? Why does it matter if it's a new VMA or not? It's fine. It's a new VMA. You just need to you just need to update it 
in the um, up three as well as in the RB3. Right. So we, we, we essentially we would be inserting a new VMA as opposed to the old VMA. Yes. I actually don't really get how that works now. When we split, the RMAP tree keeps the giant VMA, <laughs> VMA in there. Um, so they must. I don't really get how that how it gets decreased. And I I've asked a few times, and nobody could could tell me. Does anybody know how that works? Like if I have a VMA and I split a VMA. Um, it gets taken out of the, the RMAP tree, but whatever's behind that VMA, I, I, don't, I don't get how that's managed. Like, where does the pages get trimmed on, on the anon VMA once you split it? I don't really, uh, I guess nobody really here can answer it. Nobody's listening. Not out of the top of my head. It's uh, every but time you know I look at a map, I, I, have, I have to take several days to page it back in. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated thing. Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, the, other, the other thing about the, uh, I guess it's the, uh, the, the file backed. Uh, do you see an issue there at all? For the file side? Yeah. I think it's exactly the same as the unknown side. It's probably a bit simpler, but the like you're probably better off looking at the file side than the unknown side. Unknown side has a some extra complications on top that are not really relevant to like the difference doesn't is not important. Okay. Because okay. Anon has the thing about like you know if you fork multiple times and blah blah blah, uh, which doesn't exist for files. So um, yeah, same and shared or something. The the two chains. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 That's a. Ignore that. That's not relevant to to your problem. Uh, just look at the file thing. If you make the file thing, the anon thing will work too. Okay. Um, okay. And then the other the other thing is the the changes to the uh, to the forking. Uh, I don't think there's an issue there either. Um, you know, basically, take the lock and copy the tree, and then and then drop the old lock. Yeah, I think that. Uh, fine. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that shouldn't be an issue, I don't think. Um, and so, uh, the uh, the SPF stuff. So you're you're changing. You want to change the locks as well for that, right? So for SPF, so. I don't like the part when you're talking about uh, having uh, ref counts for VMAs that ref counts that really are locks in the sense that you might have to block on them. And that's still an unprecise thing and blah, blah, blah. Uh, unprecise in the sense that you might end up blocking because there's a patrol that took a ref count on a VMA and there's someone trying to bite on a different part of that VMA, but it doesn't know. We the only thing we know about the page is that it took a ref count, so we don't know where it's exactly working. And so, my preferred way to deal with that would be to make SPF um, actually work in the sense that we would want SPF. Like um, instead of taking a ref count to prevent vitals, we would want in, we would want 
to uh, have the page fault not not prevent writers and have a reliable way to check at the end if there was a writer that actually interfered with it. Okay, so I was thinking, so first off, for people who are listening, the, the ref count on the VMA uh, it goes with the, uh, with the inactive thing because uh, if, or, or the RCU uh, version, uh, because when you, when you get a VMA, if you need, you want to make sure that VMA stays around for some reason, then you can increment the ref count on the VMA was, was the idea. Uh, so, um, my, yeah, my thoughts on the, on the, oh, go ahead, Matthew. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was just yeah, no, no. Um, Okay, so, so we, we could actually do without adding a, a ref count to the VMA, I think. Um, so the reason we have the ref count on the VMA in, in, in our architecture is that um, we, we, we've hit a slow path, right? We, we, we have got to the point where uh, we have, uh, we, we, we realize we're going to need to call into a file system or a device driver in order to handle a page fault. And that code might well sleep and you can't sleep while holding the RCU read log. So the, so the idea was to take a ref count on the VMA, drop the RCU read lock, call the fault handler. Um, okay, thanks James. Um, and so, yes, you're gonna call into file system code. You do need a reference on the file, which right now you get through the VMA. Um, that's right. So, 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 what we could do instead is what the um, the 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 horrible hack we have in filemap.c does right now, which is to take a, a ref count on the struct file, and that pins everything that needs to stay pinned. Um, yeah. So, in, in, we need to go back and uh, unlock the uh, and, and and look up VMA again, but. I mean, it's slow path, so who cares? Yeah. Well, the ref count is, uh, it's a time savings, right? Maybe we could find some other way of doing it. So, um, um might be more efficient than just restart. Well, in, in uh, my current patch set, I have an unprecise check, right? That's based on just a writer uh, sequence count. You can have a precise check behind an unprecise one. You could have, you know, check, has, was there any writer? If there wasn't, you're done. Uh, if there was a writer, no, you want to know if it interfered with you. And so you, like, you, you, you could look into doing it that way. We could do, but I mean, we still need to go back and look up the VMA again. Only if there was a writer. So you would have the version, the whole tree, I think, and at that point, it's the whole memory space potential uh, modification, any modification on the memory space, right? Like it, right. Uh... I mean, I'd, I'd rather go and look up the VMA again, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially with RCU. I mean, they keep it RCU safe. What do you do with the ref cam? It's, uh, it's an added complexity. Um, I, I, the the sequence counter on your uh, uh, this. Sorry, I was reading James's comment. The sequence counter on your speculative page faults. Um, I. I'm under the impression, uh, and I'm, uh, I wanted to clarify that, um, if it's speculative page fault, hold on, if there's any activity in the VMA or the, or in, in the, uh, in the area, then it will re it, it'll throw out the work. Is that, is that right? So in, in my current patch, it, what you mean? Yeah. Yes. So I just have, so yes, what I have right now, I have an imprecise check. I do not try to prevent writers. And if there's any writer at all that happens during my speculative fault at the end, it will abort. 
it doesn't try to find if that writer interfered with that specific fault or not. It just it just has an imprecise check. Now, the reason it works okay is that in the path in the common path, the fault is probably very fast and usually won't will not frequently have a writer that interferes. If there's a writer that interferes, usually that's because the fault had to allocate memory and reclaim and do something slow. And that work that it did is not really wasted because in the end, we probably would have to have reclaim memory anyway. So it kind of works in, it's imprecise, it's not great, but the work it does is not completely wasted. We probably needed to reclaim memory anyway. So that, that's kind of how it works in, 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 in that way. It's not, it's not great. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think my only concern about it is uh, when you take a speculative page fault, uh, if there's if there's writer contention, then the speculative page fault will almost always fail, uh, which means you will be burning more CPU when there is contention on the MF semaphore. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yes. It's just okay. the work we do in the speculative page first usually won't be completely wasted because it did reclaim a page or you know whatever. It, it did allocate it did allocate a page, which usually if it was expensive, that was because of reclaim and yeah. Yeah, so it's not that expensive anyways. And the trade-off is for the most part, you're getting you're getting faulted in pages uh, that you actually want. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was talking to Blastmail about it uh, on RC, and we weren't sure on that point. Okay. I do think it would be better to make it precise. It's just hard to make it precise in all cases. The the hard case is the copy and write case. So um, if during the page roll we end up copy and writing something. Uh, right now, the the copy is protected because we know the original page is uh, read only and will stay read only when we copy it. Um, but if we allow writers to proceed in parallel with us, th they may write into the page we're copying, and the page protect the PT might end up being the same at the end of it all. Uh, when we check it, like the VMA, the PT might be back to, to read only when we check it at the end. Yeah. And, and your check is on flags and the addresses and stuff, or is that just the, the sequence? Um, I check the sequence. So yeah. I, I just do the simple checks and it's an, any byte or add-on I bought. And, um, and it's an odd even, right? Yeah, hard call. Um, um, odd, odd means that there is currently a writer. If it's higher than when you started, it means somebody has at least started writing to it. They might not have finished making a change yet, but there's the, the tree is notionally out of date. Yes. And those sequence, that's a tree wide? No, it's an MM wide. Yes. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out figure how how it will fit into the to, to the maple tree if I don't think it does. Um, at least my, my my model of my mental model of how this is all going to work doesn't include a, a sequence counter or a sequence lock. Yeah, well, if if you're just doing it on updates, can it work together? <laughs> can it? I think I think it's okay if, like, if 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 the maple tree does nothing with the sequence lock, um, and it's just used for the speculative page faults, um, then basically the uh, mmap write would take the mass lock 
the lock lock the maple tree and increment the sequence counter uh, or or vice versa um, and then and then continue on and then when you unlock the same sort of thing um, is it, do you see an incompatibility Matthew yes <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm really confused why we see I, 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 I see SPF as being uh, some of the benefits of, of, of what we're doing but not all of them um, so if, if, if we convert over to doing everything the maple tree way I don't understand what SPF would get us I think I think basically what what would happen is the page the pages backing the VMAs will be loaded before somebody looks up the VMA is would be the goal. The part I'm trying to avoid is when you have a page fault that would somehow map the entire VMA as uh, having a read going on in there. And then when and then that prevents you from having a vital change any part of that VMA because you don't know if that in actually interferes with that call or not. So that's oh. the, the part I'm not happy with that I'm trying to find a way around. Okay, so I think we can change our locking to 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 well locking. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so reference count slash locking slash everything else scheme to do that because you know, we, we we don't need to take a ref count on the vma i i was thinking that taking a ref count on the vma was better than taking a ref count on the file just from a um cross cpu contention point of view but perhaps that's just over optimization we don't need to do that so it makes everything else too hard so perhaps just drop that and go back to taking ref count on the file i'm, I'm okay with that if you don't actually block a vital walking somewhere else, then uh, then I'm okay with it. I, I'm not set on speculative or whatever. Like as as long as you don't have that false conflict, that I think that that's great. Okay, um, I, I I will think about this some more, but I I don't see a reason to to not just do this with a file ref count at this point. Um, I'll keep thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the past, one issue that has happened there is people who do weird thing, and it's usually tests uh, that may, in the end, uh, unmap that VMA, even in a racy way, and then try to unmount the file system. And so at that point, they will see uh, an active file ref count and what do we do with it? How, how long do we like? Bleh. So I, I don't have a solution to that. And even doing things like RCU can trigger this test, like they do whatever they do, and then they want to unmount and they, they're still within the RCU uh, grace period, so they cannot unmount right away. So for the if they don't have races just waiting one RCU grace period could you know get around that uh but if they actually do race these things that we take file ref counts for then oh how the hell are we gonna handle that i don't know i think it would be just fine to tell them it busy if they actually try to if they actually try to fault why they you know why why they unmount that vma why they unmap that vma uh, like, you know, they have a race, the thing is actually busy, sorry, whatever, we don't support you. I, I don't know, but it's going to show up in that covert way. It's so you're saying you're on, you're on mapping a VMA that is currently being read somewhere? Is that? Yes, there are tests doing weird shit, and I think including that. And so yeah, I was right cool. now they yeah, cannot but... map that VMA because of the page fault, so that will synchronize it. Um, yeah. I don't so know. I, 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 don't, I don't think I, I think I understand what you're saying, and if, if if I'm right, then we're not vulnerable to it. So let, let me let me just say what I think you said, and then explain why we're not vulnerable to it. So what you're saying is that um, under some circumstances there can be a 
uh, a reference count held by a VMA, which is only released at the end of an RCU grace period. And so if you try to unmount during that RCU grace period, the file system is going to be e-busy because we've, we've got to wait for the end of that grace period until the VMA drops its ref count. Yes, and we did see issues with that just when I was trying to handle files in my uh, SPF patch set by deferring freeing of VMAs. And that, that triggered that whatever these tests are doing. Yeah, so I, I think this, the design we currently have does not hold a reference count across an RCU grace period. So when it's no. freeing, am I wrong? No, no, it doesn't. No, you're wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, 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 so the RCU grace period is only to free the memory of, of the VMA. The VMA drops its reference to the right. file at, at freeing time and then RCU delays the, the releasing of the memory that the VMA consumes. Yes. You were just talking of taking the file reference during the page fault. Uh, That's correct. Yes. And the possible race is that someone could try to unwrap that thing while the page was going, which I'm arguing we should not protect against because we don't know where the fault's occurring. But now after they do that, after they unmap that VMA, they could also try to and run the file system and they're gonna race with your fault happening in the background. Okay, so but that, but that's, hang, hang on, hang on. So, so that, 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 that would be them trying to unmount a file system while there's actually IO going on to that file. Yes, I agree. Just that's, that should be easy. Someone would tell you how come there's <laughs> IO if I was able to, to unmap my VMA? and there's still I.O. going on into it, right? That's the confusion that we have. Okay, yeah, so, so the unmap today would block until the fault are completed, but we're, we're actually just going to unmap even though the, um, even though the fault um, is ongoing. That's an interesting point. I would be ready to argue that is their own downfall for doing something racy <laughs> and that I don't care. But I don't know if people will object to that. So like you press the eject button on some device and it's, or you're pulling your USB stick out really slowly or like, I don't know. Uh, isn't the issue you have to protect the VMA from being deleted while the fault handler is running? Because the fault handler probably relies on the private data memory. I'd like to thank our device driver expert for speaking up at this point. <laughs> fault yeah, J J Jason's right. We We actually need to protect we do need to prevent the VMA from going away. We do. Unless we go and audit every single fault handler. But the, the guarantee we, we currently provide to the device driver today is that we're not going to delete the VMA in the middle. Uh, I think we do need a VMA ref count after all. Thank you, Jason. So we take the VMA ref count and we do our work. If, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. An, an unmap does have to delay it on anything on a VMA with a positive ref count. The other thought that I had when I was listening to you guys is, I, I wonder if you could arrange something where there could be multiple VMAs in existence that span the same virtual ah. address space. <laughs> No, how would you, you would, you would need like a versioning system to figure out, well, if someone looks up the, looks well, up the address, just, what are you giving if, them? Before you get too excited here, it, it <laughs> solves a lot of your RCU problems because that's how RCU is meant to work, right? Where you can have two copies of things and you have to ask yourself what, what information is in that VMA. I was just looking at it and 
it looks to me like the main sticking point is the private data. So if you could work out a lifetime model of the private data where the splitting and the joining, you could have like background copies of the private data that's still valid and background copies of the VMA and somehow your locking all works out or your ref counting all works out. Uh, You're well, like at least talking of almost another abstraction layer where you hand off something so that they can play with the private data and the private data exists beyond the grace period. Is that the private data, the private data is kind of logically associated with the, the address range, not necessarily. Sure, the but if, if, right. if, if the VMA is guaranteed to never shrink or split, then you're only going to get more space. So those addresses with the private data remain constant, even though the VMA has been replaced by an even bigger VMA or what have you. Well, I was thinking in the case of talking about the arm app and how do you work with the, the maple tree and things, because if you could have multiple VMAs that are the same, like aliases of the same, then, then somehow you could make all that locking dance work out because you can, you could update the maple tree RC world with, you know, one copy of it, the true copy and leave the arm app with the old copies while you go then back to the arm app and fix it. Right. It's, it's, Okay, guys, time to shuffle off stage left. You've used your 45 minutes. It's time to get the next boss on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I think Mike is here. Yep. Okay, you already have presenter. So if you have any slides, you can upload them. Otherwise, away you go. Uh, how do I upload slides? <laughs> Little plus sign bottom left, click on it, manage presentations, click upload slides and it will now upload them. Yeah. Uh, and I don't see anything happens. Uh, let me. It, uh, it did. Okay. I think it worked. And you want to turn on video as well? Uh, one thing at a time. Okay, so uh, in a short recap, what are we talking about? Uh, the direct map, uh, I apologize for ARM and PowerPC folks, uh, they call it linear map. Uh, the direct map is the mapping of uh, the physical memory with uh, some probable, probably some offset when a uh, randomization is enabled. But for the simplicity, we can assume that uh, there is no uh, there is no offset uh, in this. So this example shows how two eight uh, gigabyte uh, physical memory banks are uh, mapped into the kernel virtual address space on x86. So uh, the bank that starts at zero will have a virtual address of uh, four Fs, eight, and then zeros on four level system. Uh, there will be a, a hole between the banks uh, and the second bank that has physical address of uh, two eight zeros will have a virtual address of FF eight O two eight zeros. So uh, the, uh, the direct map is uh, one of the main vehicles to access uh, physical memory via a uh, KMALOC page, uh, struct page and so on. Uh, so practically anything that doesn't use VMALOC uh, accesses physical memory through uh, direct map addresses. Now, uh, there are cases uh, for x86 and PowerPC, a direct map is uh, created using large pages, as large pages as possible. So uh, if there is enough uh, memory, uh, x86 uses uh, one gig uh, pages to create the direct mapping of the physical memory. 
and the, the areas that can't be mapped with the gigabyte pages uh, are mapped with two mega or four K pages. Uh, uh, there are cases when uh, Okay, do you still hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. I think Bustamel was trying to ask I, a it question. It's about loss of a connection, sorry. I, I, I uh, so uh, there are cases when uh, certain operations require splitting of the large pages in the physical memory, in the direct map. And this uh, causes uh, some performance degradation, depending on the area, on the benchmark, and what is happening. Uh, so, in a sense, if we'd like to have, a, a, I think it's an next slide. A, a, if we are allocating an object at this address, and then we call something like set direct map invalid or set memory read only or set, set uh, change any other page attributes we would cause uh, the split of one gigabyte page that uh, maps uh, this region and uh, it will uh, it will be mapped as uh, two me two mega pages at the beginning two mega pages in the end and then these two megabytes will be mapped with 4k pages to allow a change of uh, attributes in a single 4k page The, the use cases, there are a couple of use cases that already exist in the kernel that cause uh, these uh, splits of the direct memory. Uh, these are modulus, BPF, uh, F-trace, k props, uh, uh, essentially anything that calls uh, set memory uh, APIs. There is also MemFD secret uh, that uh, splits large pages in the direct map. Uh, and the upcoming use cases, uh, such as uh, protecting page tables with PKS uh, and the uh, AMD secure nested pages that requires uh, to exclude pages from direct map when they become guest private and put them back when they become uh, shared between the host and the guest. Uh, I think TDX will also need something like that. I'm not sure. And uh, uh, regarding the performance, I, last year I ran some benchmark, uh, benchmarks on the, my laptop. Uh, so uh, this benchmark checked what happens if the direct map is entirely filled with 4K or 2 meg pages. Uh, the results, uh, uh, the, res the results uh, I'll show in, in the next slide are not so disastrous. Uh, and the, I remember the the Intel uh, zero day lab uh, also did a bunch of experiments and published their results here. Uh, so it's uh, not really awful, but it's still not nice to uh, to have 4K mappings. Uh, there there was no clear winner for for one gig or two meg pages, but uh, it's definitely a 4K uh, underperforming all the cases, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, another thing about bench, uh, the, the, uh, these, uh, these represent uh, data access. Uh, when I tried uh, to check what happens with the fragmentation of high kernel mappings uh, that uh, map the kernel code, uh, the results are far more uh, severe, and I easily got like 20% degradation from MTR benchmark when the code was mapped with 4K pages rather than 2 meg and 1 gig pages. So the suggestions to reduce the heat uh, of the direct map fragmentation and to allow a uh, uh, and to allow more API, more functionality that requires the uh, 4K pages in uh, some places, uh, were largely to reuse uh, the large pages that were already split, and uh, then uh, uh, amortize uh, the effect of direct map splitting and uh, provide 4K pages from the large pages that already were allocated. Uh, like when there is a request for 4K that uh, will have different uh, attributes uh, in the page table uh, than its neighbors, 
reallocate just for example two megabyte page and split this page to 4k chunks and hand down 4k chunks each time a new 4k page with a particular attributes is requested and there were a couple of uh, variants of this mechanism posted on list there was a uh, something uh, some sort of uh, allocation caching with the uh, uh, which i implemented with genalog for secret mem uh, at some point of its uh, the patches lifestyle uh, there was uh, what rick implemented with the shrinker and he called it group page cache uh, group page allocator uh, for the uh, page table pages and there was uh, my last RFC about uh, making a cache with a shrinker kind of next level to the page allocator uh, uh, and uh, basically uh, we've stopped the discussion at that point uh, more or less uh, without actual agreement where the cache should be placed near the consumer or near the page allocator and uh, this is both uh, mainly to discuss uh, the alternatives so uh, i try to summarize at least my view on uh, how is this works uh, uh, the caches uh, that are closer to user are probably simpler to implement they have uh, better access control in the sense that the user knows knows how the pages are used what uh, attributes they have uh, there is a possibility to compact those caches uh, to have uh, ability to recreate large pages uh, when the cache be becomes fragmented uh, i believe these caches would have larger memory overhead on overall system because if there are several users users that use uh, such caches uh, each cache will have its own uh, stale memory that uh, can be reclaimed at any time uh, the apparently will be higher fragmentation of the direct map there will be more splits uh, than with the unified cache or something like that and uh, if whenever uh, the user frees a page it should be freed exactly to the cache it was allocated from and from my experiments i've done for the last year with the uh, different address space isolation uh, stuff uh, freeing is the most difficult part because when you allocate the page you know what context you are in and so it's easier to put it in the right place right page table whatever uh, when the page is freed uh, especially if we have to, to reuse the existing freeing mechanisms such as the tlb mmu gather and so on uh, or page uh, page freeing uh, via VM, in the vm scan, VM scan uh, the pages uh, the, the only information we get about the context is what we may store in struct page and it's not very convenient uh, so in that sense if we move the key pages uh, as close to page allocator as possible uh, it probably will result in more intrusive changes and the cache will be a black box uh, to its users so uh, it it would be really hard to make allocations movable and uh, do something like compaction, for example. But I believe it would be more memory efficient overall with lower fragmentation of the direct map. And uh, it's not my bullet core MM integration. <laughs> Last email. I thought it was your bullet. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Maybe it was. Uh, anyway. added, uh, oh, yeah. So, added, given uh, the integration with the page allocator of closeness to the page allocator, probably the freeing would be not as complex to implement. And I think it was the idea. Uh, uh, oops. So, uh, that's in the intro. And now uh, I, I've seen there was a question in. Ah, I've seen there was something in chat, but it was not about this. Um, I was going to add, Mike, um, the other benefit of the page allocator uh, is that you can use the buddy parts to get higher order allocations, which um, would actually be useful for the, right. the PKS table stuff. Uh, right. Otherwise, you'd need to re-implement it in the cache that is uh, 
per yep. user close to user yeah and why do you need higher order allocations for page tables? page tables for instance uh, on x86 require two pages for pgd yeah for um i think also for um for pti there's a order one allocation uh, the pgd in, uh, when pti yeah. is on the pgd yeah. allocation is ordered to order one yeah. It should be order zero, no? Uh, when uh, PGD is on, there are for, two checks yeah. in PGD. Uh, one is uh, user visible, and uh, one is only kernel visible. And yeah. whenever That's there is PGD, a, yeah, but PTE. Uh, PTE is one is order zero. Yeah, but it, it's the one that gets. It's not the one that uh, the hardware doesn't use an order one page, but just the kernel does or allocates an order one page. So it's just yeah. how the how the software is written. In general, PTI can be changed to use uh, per CPU offsets or something when it does a context switch. Yeah. But the bit flipping is neat trick. So my next thought was to try to actually make it a, a migration type in a sense, a great type in a sense add another list to freely area and see what we can get from it. I never actually started to implement it because I really don't have enough background on how page allocator works and so on. It will take me a while to get there. But the idea was to do like something similar to my great CMA. Yeah, I noticed in your RFC that you mentioned it as a possibility and I was thinking a bit about it today and yeah I was going to say that maybe that should work <laughs> but you already <laughs> planned yeah. it as well <clears throat> because uh, one of the issues you had in the RFC was that you used some more bits from the from the page block map I forgot the exact name but now we use only four bits I yeah i remember I, I should have used eight but yeah, i used yeah. five yes which doesn't work but 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 for my great types i think there's like six of them at most today if you have cma i am afraid we still need to increase uh, the page block I, bits I, I think if you Add one more migrate uh, type, it will still fit in the three bits we have for that. Uh, and and we have oops. a movable, movable, reclaimable PCP, which is four, a CMA is five, and isolate is six. Yeah, the PCP types is LES. Yes, it, it's LES with high atomic. So one, two, three. We have four. I think we have six. We have four uh, unconditional and the uh, two more conditional. Yeah, so that would be seven. That would that be seven. Should still fit within the three by bits uh, and, yes. and if it would be a migrate type then hopefully would also don't need special cases uh, in the body uh, operations it will, it will need some special cases like say me i believe because you can't fall back from it to different you can fall back to it. Uh, yeah, fall, fallbacks have some tables that can be set up properly. Uh, but, the, but the question is if it has to detect like merging I mean, two blocks where one of them is of this type and I think it shouldn't. I think we shouldn't merge blocks with uh, this type. So they, they, they apparently they would be excluded from compaction and they 
and so on. My then thing they... is we, we'll have some special cases like CMA does in this, but probably in other places. Uh, we'll... I'm, I'm not sure if we need any special page flag or just by know. seeing it's in the it's in the I proper migrate I... type. I don't think only the page flag. I think we, we can we take to Mac. Let's let's consider x86 standard standard uh, sizes. Uh, we take to Max and we we mark the entire page block as a migrate type, whatever it's called. Uh, and so. Uh, the allocation will be quite similar to what I did in the previous RFC. And the freeing will see that my grade type is such and such, and uh, it can put uh, the page back on the same, uh, on the appropriately list without having a page, uh, without having a page flag. Page flag would have been easy. If we had page flags, it would have been easy. Then you can check if the page needs some special handling virtually anywhere, right? Uh, by the way, uh, does any of the use case need to support the situation where we don't know upfront that this page might be eventually at some point needed to be set read I, only or unmarked. I think, yeah, I think, I think, KCV, uh, I think KCV and TDX. Uh, so, so we should support also like uh, we are converting arbitrary page to one of the uh, to 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 this scheme, which I think should work, right? Because we would just flag the change the migrate type of the page block, and, uh, and basically that would be it. Because then it would become part of this cache, right. and all the further. So what, what you suggest, like I th I've seen in the uh, CV patches, they do sometimes they set uh, direct map on, set direct map off, uh, set direct map invalid, valid, whatever. Uh, so uh, you suggest that whenever page gets uh, uh, different attributes that its neighbors, we mark the entire page block as a, let's say, not in direct map or somehow. And then uh, whenever pages are freed uh, in this page block, we will know to reuse them, you to reuse them as a, a part of this new migrate type. Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, but the question is, can we detect the cases where we no longer need this and convert the page book black back? Uh, probably have, mean like scanning the direct map and uh, if we see that all the pts are mapped and read write then we can convert uh, it to a huge page again and change the migrate type it's more like scanning uh, because we I have no other that, tracking more, except the page tables we can scan from the free list side so whenever we have two megs free in the same well, if it's free, mm -hmm. that's the simple case, but... Uh, are you mean my... uh, what yeah, happens if you have the, the same uh, two mags with the same uh, permissions uh, again, or at yeah. some point? Because uh, if, if, if we just temporarily change some page to read only and later back, 
while there are other pages on like the same two people. megabyte block. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be worth quite... to support this detection that we can. I think Kirill has some patches about something like that like two years ago or so. Doing a collapse of a mapping in the direct map. Okay. But he didn't uh, hook it into anything particular, and then uh, he, I th I believe he stopped working on this. I, mean, I think the easiest place to check would be when you're setting a page read write. Just check if the rest of the larger pages read write and do it then. It's already right. a pretty heavyweight operation. So I mean, like check the the other five hundred eleven pages, or just the. Uh... Schedule this check and then, yeah, periodically that process would be good. the scheduled. I mean, you also probably want to go um, batch the re you know the the reconversion to large pages as well. It'd be nice if you could do one shoot down for several, um, you know, two megabyte regions of broken down to four K pages. I think we can. Save some shoot downs on the some of the transitions. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the usage though. So one of the thoughts why I suggested using 4K in the cache and then letting the actual user to decide on the final permissions. It was partly because of it that uh, that when you allocate the two Mac page and split it into 4K, uh, at the page allocator or at the cache level, you don't need to bother what actual permissions will be. You only need to provide 4K pages for, for the users. And then uh, the whole TLB, uh, TLB management will be delayed until the actual user would like to change the permissions to read only read right back on and so on. It would be um, nice if when you got those 4K pages, they were unmapped already, because then you don't yeah. need to do a, a shoot down to, to set the permission. They're just ready to have a permission applied to them. So. Uh, I actually thought that I, I keep the 4K pages mapped and they uh, they are still mapped in the cache. Uh, and then uh, the user will decide when to do the shut, shut downs. And Mark says you want to place pages. Uh, you might want to place that in the pages before mapping. Uh, I think, Rick, actually, you had some use case when you needed to invert uh, the mapping and mapping in the page tables because you had to have it mapped. Sorry? I, think, I think there was a, a, a case in the PKS page tables when you needed to uh, somehow uh, do additional map or additional map to make uh, the, to update the page tables. Maybe I'm using KMAP local, therefore Where? not the direct map, but something temporary yeah. elsewhere or not? Yeah. Well, for PKS, if you need to write to these pages, uh, you just can toggle the key. It's pretty easy. Um, oh, yeah, that's so that's um, the keys. I'm not quite sure what. Uh, you just write in the star. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need to update the PT. But I mean, if. It, if you if you're allocating a bunch of um, if you have some usage that wants some kind of permission page, and you're allocating a bunch of um, uh, you need to get a bunch of pages like page tables or something, and then you have to shoot down every time. I'm not sure that the I mean you're you're right that you're clustering you're still getting the clustering in the direct map, but you're not getting the shared um, shoot down. Like the, the the fact that you could batch you can you, you talked about amortizing the cost of the shoot down so you convert a bunch of pages in in bulk and then you get a bunch of pages from that one shoot down. If you just so, leave them as read write. But then in, for your use case, for instance, for PKS, if you have it unmapped from the first from the beginning, like whenever we allocate 
to make page, we unmap it, uh, we flush the TLD. Mm -hmm. And then is there, when there is a request for 4K page, it should be mapped back again with the new permissions, right? Um, uh, so you're saying that page allocator would, would, um, would, would do so that it, application with permission or the, the, the caller of the page allocator would? The caller would, might need to map it. So for instance, yeah. if it will be page table page, you'd need to, to map it to, to create the page table entries. And then mm -hmm. you set a new permission with the say PKSK, right? Uh, so this map back and forth probably is an, uh, you still need, well, uh, actually with, with PKS, you don't need to flush TLB, right? Um, when you apply a PKS key to some memory, that re does require a flush. But the thing is, it, it won't require a flush if the page was already unmapped, because then it can't be cached. So that's kind of the benefit of having in the page allocator a bunch of unmapped pages and I almost wondered if like we could do something like we combine these two things where the page allocator manages unmapped pages. Uh, and then, you know, maybe you could even get handed back permission pages and it knows it can, it can re unmap them in bat in, because you can, if you unmap a page, you've kind of done the, you sort of, um, you can do one flush for a bunch of pages that are going to end up being in different permissions that you don't even know yet if you have them unmapped. And then when they get handed back, you just quick write the permission to the page table entry and then it's ready to go. Does that make sense? And so you could even have the, the per user caches could handle applying the permissions if you don't want to have the page allocator know about every type of different permission that might come up. Um, Maybe. I need to think more about it. <laughs> okay. But, but um, maybe. Now, Vlastimil, uh, did you look uh, into SCV actually what they need? Uh, because I only had some quick glance of the patches in there. Yes, so. Um, so they. So for one of the cases uh, for the SEV SNP is that uh, some pages allocated that should be uh, private in the guest, which means there is this encryption going on and, uh, and the host is not supposed to access it. And uh, and for that, there's a RMAP table that tracks the state of each page. And so this page will be marked as like the guest private something. And uh, then the problem is that if this page stays mapped as part of some two megabyte direct map, mapping and the host accesses some different page within the same two megabytes then the then the snp machinery will check the rmp table for all 512 pages because it is about to create a two megabyte tlb entry so it has to check everything within these two megabytes and it will see, oh, but there's one four kilobyte page within this range that gets private and we are not supposed to uh, touch it. So we cannot install the TLB entry for it and therefore it all fails. So it needs to split the map even without needing to change permissions. So it simply need to be 4K page. Or, and or, they... or, or, uh, or I think what they do no, is I they think unmap it. It should be unmapped. Because it's simpler. <laughs> and then we can detect that there's such page. So, so two max should be split it, and then uh, the page that became guest private should be unmapped entirely. Yeah. Rick, Rick do you know if TDX is, does something similar or? Is... Uh, so it has some, yeah, it has something else 
Um, I can't give like an authoritative answer, but I believe it was around um, rights to the encrypted memory. So, um, yeah, I can't give an authoritative answer. Uh, last last time I saw that series was focusing mostly on the user space mapping and not the direct mapping, but um, I'd have to go back and look. I guess uh, Dave Henson would know, but I don't yeah. see him. I don't see Dave here. James might know. James? James is too busy with something different, probably. You'd have to repeat the question. Hang on. What? Uh, does TDX need to unmap the private pages from the direct map? If you know, TDX needs to unmap the guest VM pages from the direct. Uh, actually, I don't think it needs to unmap them from the direct map. It just needs to make them inaccessible to anybody else to prevent the machine being crashed. So unmapping them from the direct map would be the safest thing to do. Kirill's the guy who's been doing the patch set for this. Hey, but Kirill is not here, right? And Dave also is not here. Hey. Because last email was saying that uh, SAV SMP needs to, uh, if there is a 4K out of the MEG become private to, to the VM, they must be unmapped from the direct net. Because the way yeah. how SMP machinery works. So I think uh, that's you believe it think. would need something similar. Probably. I mean, it would certainly prevent ROP attacks from crashing the system uh, using the TDX page protection. So essentially, if this page is mapped in two meg in the TDX system, any access to those two meg may create a, a may create a machine check, may cause a machine check. Yeah. So I think I'm remembering that when we were working on this, we thought um, that it could be if we're going to go through the trouble of of having this. Um, the special uh, management of private pages that it could be nice to have a um, a mode with, that just uses software to you know existing hardware features to unmap uh, guest memory on the direct map kind of like kind of like ex ex the exclusive page frame ownership concept um, and I think that's where the direct map unmapping came from because I think at some point that series did have a direct map unmapping um, piece. But I'm just looking through the last um, RFC, and I don't see anything about the direct map. And that's um, about the TDX, or yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So I think it's just focusing on unmapping from um, host user space. So like QMU's view of the of the of the. Um, Is it this set that used the memory failure infrastructure for that? Oh, it's another one. I, I'm quite behind the list. So. Oh yeah, Greg says that memory failure is also yeah. a use case because it wants to avoid speculation accessing yeah. the poisoned memory. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, another thing on the having a, a cache of unmapped pages um, is that all the vmalloc so there's also a, a, uh, applying kernel memory permissions to the vmalloc alias, which you know there's not always a vmalloc alias, but you can create one. And when that happens, you don't really care about the direct map anymore. So, uh, like for modules, for example, it's going to go get random pages from the page allocator and then set memory at the same time the permissions on the direct map and on the uh, vmalloc alias. Like for example, um, like setting it executable or something. Uh, in which case, if you have unmapped pages in the direct map, you can just leave that alone and just apply the permissions on the um, vmalloc alias. So in, in this case, you don't need to do uh, any, if you have unmapped pages already, you don't need to do any shoot downs. You can just apply the permissions and, you know, um, as long as you have it's some other way to load it. The initial shoot down. When you, yeah, I mean, it, one, when yeah, you, it, when at you some point you need to batch unmap them, but then after that, you can just sort of apply, you can have like a, you know, for example, if you're going to load, you know, sometimes people load lots of JITs, PPF JITs or something. You can do that with with zero, you know, average zero shoot downs. Of course, there's the batch shoot down at some point, but and it's kind of a BPF, nice benefit. PPF only uses say, the vmalloc alias. Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually in a different address 
area, but it's basically a vmalloc mapping. Um, okay. And I think also, you know, for some of the PKS um, usages, like there was one, the one where they were, uh, it was uh, Elena um, Reshatova was doing one where she, um, you could, you would map in vmalloc using PKS to protect a key. So all those kind of key storage um, usages also could benefit from like having a shoot downless uh, creation of PKS memory. You know, I remember you... there were some patches I, Ryan, Elena did about uh, using a PKA, yeah. PKS to protect the uh, key rings and so and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. there could be a lot. There could be more kernel secrets that could use the same thing. But the, you know the. Uh, depending on how often the secrets are allocated, you might not want to do shoot downs all the time. Right. So, uh, uh, I'll... yeah, yeah I have just some implementation concerns. Uh, if if we go with the with the migrate type way, then uh, it would be very hard or intrusive if we wanted to guarantee that all pages that are on the free list of that migrate type are in some predefined state like unmapped, like you just proposed. It, it would be fine if we, if we could just assume that mostly they are in that state and if it happens some of them is not we will just do the unmap on allocation and pay this cost but if, but otherwise if we just check okay is this page really unmapped okay it is i don't have to unmap it again and do the tlb shutdown then it should work rather fine and not be too intrusive on the page allocator if we want this this guarantee then we would be <laughs> we would have to be as intrusive as the page isolation i'm afraid which so i think i think i think it's more trade off of how fragmented how less fragmentation we want to allow versus how easy it is to manage the whole thing because so I didn't mean fragmentation, but batching of the uh, fragmentation of the direct memory. Uh, I mean uh, that. Uh, okay, let's say we have a lots of memory at the beginning, and it's uh, until uh, the memory uh, usage builds, so we can easily allocate uh, uh, high order to max pages and just split them and keep them in this list, and this won't be a problem. But at some point, we won't be able to allocate to max, and then we'll have to split. And we will have to split other at other places where there will be 4k pages of different that belong to yeah. different uh, domain protect protection domains let's say and so if we do not attempt to reduce fragmentation very much if we kind of let uh, let us uh, live with that uh, that more pages get fragmented as the system lives uh, it doesn't seem to be too complex to do all the whole tracking of uh, unmapped versus mapped. Like, okay, we we got we, we can't allocate to max, so we allocate in 4K or maybe some uh, incremental high order, but uh, we split it out uh, from the direct map uh, once, and then we continue to use it as unmapped. Yeah, but there, there will be other pages in the page block uh, which we couldn't get because we don't have two megabyte page blocks available anymore and we cannot unmap those. And at, at some but, but point, those the... will be freed and merged with our pages and then we would have no guarantee that that what's on the body allocator of this migrate we type is really unmapped can... or mapped. We can check the page table uh, yeah. and free a page from that page block. Yeah, that would have to be done. And it's not that uh, complex and it's not that slow. Yeah. 
We have so to make they, sure that we um, handle if we're going to also ever add in the repair. Can you repeat it? Yeah, so you're you're saying um, if we want to check if a page is unmapped, we can just check the page table. Is that your was that your comment? Yeah, I just yeah. said that if we're going to ever remerge the pages, we have to make sure that those checks don't race with the remerging. Um, I thought we would check in free one page, one of the free some pages. Yeah. We talked about having like a would, like a batch list that would accrue things that's supposed I, to remerge. I, I, and, I, yeah. I think it, these pages should not go to PCP lists anyway, right? And no, we wouldn't probably make this a PCP list migrate type. Too. It's one minute, uh, and then uh, when when we call one of the free one page or free the page or one of those that uh, somewhere deep uh, deep in chain, uh, we I think we can make the check race free. But but yeah, it does seem like it's not too many more accesses than just checking a page flag. So um, kind of like the idea. Uh, so I think we have some ideas how to move forward. After the conference season is over, I will try to create the new RFC. <laughs> and now it's, time is up. Uh, so yeah. thanks, Mike, everybody. Mike, as a reminder, you can take a hacker and then move to it if you want. We've got quite a few empty ones. Uh, I think we're good. Guys, yeah. Okay, in that case, I need Atish Patra for Risk Five. Yes. Is there anything you need to present? Yeah, I have like uh, just a couple of slides just to start. Uh, this okay, so I made you moderator if you or presenter if you look at the plus button bottom left. You can click on it, manage presentations, and then upload yep. slides, and it will switch them from mics. Okay, I'm doing that. Hey, I'm I, I'm on here too, Atish, but my it doesn't like my video. I don't know how to set the uh, uh, the device. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think that's okay. <coughs> so I think it's nine fifteen, so we can start. Atish, I'm so, here as well. This is Kumar. Hi, Kumar. Uh, Kumar is here. All is here. Okay, awesome. Wow, you have a top angle view in Philip. Hi, Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, welcome to the Risk Five Boff. So we are just uh, continuing discussion where we left uh, the Risk Five MC. Uh, you <clears throat> might not have met. Uh, some of you might not have met Mark. Mark is the CTO of Risk Five International Organization, and he oversees the all the day-to-day -day things uh, for all the specifications. All the development going on within the risk five international organization uh we wanted his input on some of the things so uh, we requested him to attend uh thanks mark for joining in so without further delay i'd like to just uh briefly state where we left and then start the discussion so this is where we left during the mc uh we just to uh, give you an overview. Uh, this is more about this session. Uh, we'll discuss more about the platform specification, and uh, if time permits, uh, probably we'll discuss what to do with the D1. So this is where the platform specification is already there. Uh, it's stable from our side. So if you have any comments, uh, it, it's still going through the review process through the uh, distros and other community members. Uh, go take a look. If you have any comments, let us know. Broadly speaking, it has to us uh, two platforms. One is OSA platform, which is targeted towards the rich OS, such as Linux, FreeBSD, Windows. 
and uh, there is a base and a server extension. So base is targeted towards the minimal uh, boot, minimal platform that can boot Linux, something like uh, Hi5 Unleashed or Unmatched, or let's say all Windows D1 or uh, Beagle 5. And server extension is obviously for enterprise. And then M platform is everything that doesn't boot, uh, doesn't have a S mode or doesn't boot on uh, rich OS, something like Atlas or bare metal. And it has a uh, PMP extension apart from the base. So for the M platform, since that uh, it's a wild, wild west area, uh, we can't really specify a lot of things. So base is really minimum things. And for security aspect, there's a PMP extension if the vendors want to uh, implement some kind of security and if they have a lower privilege mode such as SRU. And uh, the schedule is current target is to make it a uh, freeze by risk five summit, which is in December. And we are working towards uh, that. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> as we discussed uh, during the risk five plumbers, here are the specification status in uh, that are relevant to platform or relevant to Linux. H, V, the PBMT extension that uh, modifies the page table attributes for the non-coherent non uh, non IO devices, uh, and then CMO, and then the counter overflow extension SCOP PMF, all of them are frozen. So they are under public review uh, in the public domain. Uh, we can go and take a look at the specification in the uh, I said they mailing list. I also sent a mail uh, mail to the Linux S5. So all of these uh, extensions are frozen. So if any of those extensions that has patches pending in the mailing list can be uh, merged or can be at least reviewed and uh, get merged eventually now. So is this like the entire set of extensions that got frozen? No. There, there, there are more than those. So there's S time and then others, but those are the ones that are of immediate concern to our tissue. Um, yeah, so there. Are, I should also mention that there are others here that the the spec, the platform spec currently depends on that are. I'm coming to that. Not going to be frozen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That uh, these are only the ISS specific extension. I only so there are a bunch of uh, specification that got frozen. I specified these. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I just just want to say um, there there is a on the website. There's a tech wiki right off the top, uh, and if you go there, it's, there's a URL table, and there's uh, something that says uh, uh, dashboards uh, for ratification. So you can go look there and see all the specifications that are uh, in play. If there was chat here, I can't find chat. Yeah, I, 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 would, uh, I would go ahead and put the link in. Um, you can put it in the share notes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm having a hard time finding the share notes, but I, if I find on the it, left and up, on the left and up, yeah, not on my screen. So I'll try to find them. But uh, yeah, the other thing. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to say is we've only promised to Risk Five that uh, uh, the platform spec will be a draft mode at um, at Summit, and part of the reason is. Uh, and I, I don't know how much, Kamar, you've shared the, the dependency spreadsheet, but there's a whole bunch of other specs it's dependent upon. And I didn't want to go ahead and promise anything more than, than a, you know, a final draft kind of thing at that point, because I didn't know when those other specs were coming in. I don't have commitment dates on those. So we're trying to be conservative with that. Uh, but rest assured, I mean, the goal is to get this frozen uh, and ratified, uh, you know, sometime in the first quarter of next year. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so the reason I specified these because the patches are pending on these. So there are other extensions uh, that went into public review and frozen. Uh, I sent an email with the detailed list uh, to the Linux RS5, so you can take a look. Coming back to the dependency on the platform. So these are the dependency that we have on the platform specific and that are non ISA. So mainly profile. So as Mark said, depending on when profile gets stable and frozen, uh, platform spec will only can be frozen after that. <clears throat> Other specification uh, that are already uh, that the platform specification depends and already are uh, more frozen is our EVBR, EFA. Uh, we don't need any modifications to those. Then there is ACPI specification. I think uh, over the period ACPI specification will uh, evolve 
as there is more feedback from the distros and uh, uh, from the ACPA community. Yeah, Philip. You're saying something? Okay. And then uh, in terms of the interrupt control specification, the A-Clint and Plick are frozen and AIA uh, should be frozen soon. I don't know the timeline. Anup or Philip, any comment on when the AIA will be frozen? Uh, actually, there's, there's, there's one co uh, comment. So we are working on the um, on the process still. So A-Clint, Plick, uh, AM, they aren't really frozen. They're just very cold at this point. Uh, okay. So we've referred to them as stable, um, given that we we are still fine tuning the process. Uh, SPI zero point three is out. Frozen in that sense because it was going through a different process. Uh, so they are similar to being frozen. So we don't expect any any changes, but they haven't undergone public review yet, and they haven't really reached the point where. We can send them on to this pool for public review just due to a, a process issue that is being resolved at the moment. Okay. Okay. So that's all I had for the specification related things. Uh, Power. Any questions? One more. Atish. Atish uh, so SBI, uh, the recent release, uh, there was no process till now for the pure software conventions and specifications. So, so going forward, there will be a different process. But till now, I think we'll have to. Consider this as the release, right, Philip, or anything else with the existing release? It's, it's actually very simple. So we are we're moving SPI into the process, and 0.3 is what it is. It's out. There is a software release that goes with it. Uh, so that exists, and it exists outside of the risk five naming or, or label um, continuum. So SPI is V0.3. That one exists, uh, and it goes but, with the But software. is it frozen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was never frozen on the SPX specs, Palmer. No, it was. Well, I think so, the question. Yeah, 0.2 was frozen. Is no, 0 .3 so the question is here: Is it likely to change? No. Any changes? No, no, no. That is it frozen? frozen? Is are you yes. guys providing a guarantee that you're not going to change this in a backwards compatible yes. fashion? Let okay. Mark speak for a second, please. Um, this is the first time we're going through this with a platform spec. There are a lot of constituents, including you know Palmer and Paul. And Krista and Andrew, and we're going through some one-on-one -on -one reviews in October. So uh, the intent is that there, you know, when we say frozen, we mean um, a there still could be change, but it's a very small set of changes. Uh, but because this is the first time we've gone through this review for non-ISA specifications, we're taking some extra time to go one-on-one -on -one reviews with various people who are constituents in the community to make sure we got everything right. So while you may hear the words frozen or whatever for this next generation of stuff, not the last generation, I'm talking about the stuff that's coming out with this platform spec, just understand that this is our first time and we're still figuring out how to do these reviews and get all the constituents uh, to the table. I've heard um, you know, comments that there's some, some issues and I just encourage everybody, if you have issues, get onto the mailing list for the platform team and come out into the open. We can't have this stuff in, in you know, incognito and do anything about it. Um, and so rumor and innuendo don't help at all. Um, we're, we, you know, we're trying to bring things into the light and just get them done. So uh, please be patient with us during this period of time um, and understand that, again, it's our first time through with this uh, big, uh, uh, a platform spec and all dependents, uh, and you know we're hoping to get everything right, but you know we're human. We won't. So, Mark, uh, what is the thing about the platform spec in that instance? But I thought the discussion we were just having was about SBI, not about yeah. the platform. So spec. for the SBI spec, uh, will not have uh, any major technical changes. Anything, any technical, if any, there is any feedback that comes up as a technical change, it will be in the next version. But yeah, that's, 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 say again, Philip. Which is similar to the definition of frozen, because frozen yeah. just says it, there are no major or no no content changes, and if that happens, a new version needs to come out. Uh, okay. Well, that is not my understanding of what frozen originally meant. Um, 
So okay. Palma, uh, Palma, one thing is that SBI is like one of the specs which will evolve over time. So uh, you will see like for a couple of years more there will be kind of, uh, yearly release or a bi-yearly release because uh, it will evolve, right? So so for this yeah, year, yeah. it is 0.3 and that is frozen. So there is no change in 0.3 now. So my understanding of frozen did not mean that the spec was never going to change again. It meant that changes would be made in a fashion for which software could be compatible, which is a very yes. different statement. So, yes. you know, if SBI 0.4 comes out and there are no mechanisms in 0.4 for maintaining compatibility with 0.3, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. So it will not break an ad. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, no, I, at least we can assure that that will never happen because that's been always goal from our 0.2, right? We'll never yeah. break backward compatibility with any of the previous version starting so that that's how we got into this hey, hey folks, discussion the, the state definitions are now in the shared notes these are the official state definitions every single spec has to have this at the top it is the the bible as to how this works yeah from are you seeing something yeah, because I'm just trying to point out that the whole reason we're in this situation about ASPI 0.3 is that between RC1, which you guys said was frozen, and the final release, there were, you know, substantive oh. changes. <laughs> there was one substantive change, which I made because I didn't think it was frozen, um, to the spec, right? So, like, is, is RC1? The frozen version like you said it was on the mailing list or is the final release the frozen version or are neither of them frozen like which one of these is going to be what i have to be compatible with for the rest of my life <laughs> well, you know, after, yeah after rc1 we did this final release and uh, that will be that is the final thing so so, so go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so, so clearly, so you're saying that RC1 was not frozen and that I do not have to be compatible with RC1. So I think that was a small change. And then after that, some typo fixes also happened, right? So no, but, typo but, uh, happened, right? changing something from recommended to must is only a one word change, but it's a big change. Does that make sense? Like <laughs> it's a small change in terms of letters. <laughs> it's a big change in terms of meaning. <laughs> Changing from must to may not is not an editorial change. Yeah, but so 0 0.3, uh, so we didn't have, we had an informal process like a software process for SBI, zero, SBI right? So uh, that's what we had done with 0 0.2 as well. We tagged a release candidate and then we did, just like any software, we did a release. That's what we did with 0 0.3 and we didn't have this nomenclature of stable, frozen and all those things because we didn't have any process for the software or conventions, right? So. And that is yeah, the two. And if we, if we start labeling uh, stable, frozen, all those things with these tags, it's not fair because we didn't have a clear process defined at that point in time. Well, I, I mean, maybe I'm remembering this differently, but I remember pretty clearly standing up at that whatever meeting and saying that it was frozen and everybody agreeing to that and then merging the code. And that's what you know, we did uh, for the platform. We did that in the platform specification. In the I, I was saying for, sorry, I was saying for zero point two of the SBI, right? Yeah, and at that point, that, that was no. as much of a process as there was for freezing something. So we were freezing as much as anyone else did. We right? I guess that there's this, more. Sorry. No, I'm saying we followed the same process for zero dot three as well because we just said uh, followed the precedent. We asked yeah, yeah, which is, guess, which I'm yeah. totally cool with my my my. My confusion here is that when I asked, you said that RC1 was frozen, right? And then there was a, you know, a change to the spec, not not like a little wording change or whatever, a change that actually changes the meaning of the spec and how we probe stuff and whatnot, right? So like, I just I just need a clear. Okay, so <laughs> okay, let's not uh, term that as frozen because at that point in time we didn't have clear states. Okay, it was a release candidate, and we did the change, and then we released the actual spec. Okay, maybe. So, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe we're just a poor choice of words that uh, release candidate. We're just a poor choice of word uh, used during the release candidate. 
but uh, 0 0.3 is the final one. Yep. Okay, so specifically, 0 0.3 RC1 is not frozen. No. Okay. And after that, we tagged 0 0.3. It was waiting for any final reviews, just so, like you reviewed and did some change, right? So. But you told me on the mail is that RC1 was frozen, that you froze it because you came on yeah. before you had released our 0 0.3 final and told me that it, it had been frozen for a long time. Like, that's my confusion here because you yeah. know, I, I think, think there's I, a lot of misuse hey guys, of this term frozen. Yeah. Yes, guys, exactly. So, so, so from now on, let me make it very clear. Unless you hear from Philip that it's frozen, it's not frozen. He is the chairman of the, the chair of the, of the software committee. And he is the one who actually puts it up uh, to, to go out for public review. So if there was any confusion in the past, there should never be any confusion in the future. It's got to come from the software committee. It can't come from a committee underneath the software committee. Okay, great. Philip, can you send an email to the kernel mailing list saying exactly what was frozen for SBI and then we can go merge it? <laughs> Happily again, so that 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 was coming from before, and that's why I said this is still outside of the process. And I'll happily bless it as frozen at this point because we're not going to change it anymore, and anything else is going to be a new version. Okay, great. Can you just like write that in an email so there's no, no confusion about what it means in the whole song and dance, uh, right? Uh, uh, right? But <laughs> let, me, let, let me just uh, add one thing in in the end. Uh, you know, Krista is the gatekeeper. Until Krista sees something, um, there's always some chance. And that's why we say frozen, which means that it's, uh, you know, we don't expect anything, uh, but it doesn't mean that nothing will happen. And, you know, again, Krista, you know, even with his very trusted lieutenants like Andrew, you know, after they say something, sometimes he reviews it and finds things that, that need to be addressed. And so Chris, I know, I, I know Kirst. <laughs> so, 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 so Mark, that's, why, that's why these guys are doing one-on-one -on -one reviews with Krista of the platform and all the subsidiary specs in October, because if they don't do that, there's a chance that this stuff will, will, um, you, you know, morph more than we would like. And we don't want that. So we're taking the bull by the horns. Uh, we're having a one-on-one -on -one with Andrew. We're having a one-on-one -on -one with Krista. If anybody else on the phone feels like they need to do the same thing, uh, please, please contact Kumar, who drives the, the platform um, horizontal subcommittee. So, so I think one of the most important things that really needs to happen here is that these processes for how this all works needs to be documented publicly. Um, and the exact meanings of what it means to be frozen, that should be so, a very special word that no one should use unless it's actually been frozen by RVI. And if it needs Kirsten's sign off for it to be frozen, which I'm still unclear about, or, or some other committee's sign off for it to be frozen, then this really needs to be clearly documented. So, so guess what? It is clearly documented. And please put it in the notes. It, like, it, where can we it, find I'm this? I'm putting the, the policy in the notes right this second. Just hold on. Um, but but let, me make, let me explain. All the chairs of all the committees have to sign off for the plan milestone, the frozen milestone, and the vote ready milestone. So, it, it, so it's not just Krista, it's Greg for Umpriv, it's, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Andrew Dello for security, um, it's Wei Wu for the ISA infrastructure, um, and it's John Liddell for the technology sector. Those are the committee chairs that we have at the moment, and they need to sign off um, and I need to sign off before anything goes to a, a new milestone state. Okay, so has this happened with 0 0.3 for SBI? Like I said, Paul, uh, there was no process till now, and uh, not just SBI, we also have PSABI specs, which are also under the same purview because these are software conventions. And going forward, there will be a new process for such specific, which are pure software conventions, okay, or conventions, so to well, say. It will be different from. Yeah, so that's what Philip is doing, right? So Philip can elaborate that. So, yeah, I, I just want to say one more thing. Um, there, there is a non-ISA definition of done spec as well, uh, which requires um, you know certain things to be done at these points, and uh, you know people like uh, Gaj and and um, uh, Greg uh, help put that together. 
So I'm putting those links in the chat as well. Okay, okay so, so just, to, to, just to be clear then, so 0 0.3 is not yet frozen from RVI's point of view. Uh, until it passes through the DOD, it can't be frozen. Okay. Again, with, okay. with SBI 0 0.3, we've just talked about it on Wednesday. We have special situations instead it's coming out of the old process and out of the open SBI project. So, so the other thing is that's why we have the stable milestone. Stable says it's ready to be frozen, but we have to, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's. And so my suggestion, Philip, is call this stable. Let's go through the process as defined and, um, and make sure that that everybody understands, you know, what the process is. Um, question to Palma, is stable good enough for you? No, <laughs> stable has a long history of being not good enough. So yeah, I can I consider stable to be a completely meaningless term based on how it has been defined in the past. If there's a yeah, new I definition, agree. I'm happy to read it. <laughs> yeah, and if I, I agree call with that. it new stable. What do you call what? Stable. Sorry, I think stable. it's it's like cutting off the first word or two of what you say. <laughs> that, that doesn't matter. I, I said the new stable, given that the old stable was apparently not stable. So, yeah, it, like if you have a new definition of stable, and I'm happy to read it, I think Mark might have linked to it. I could try to read it. Probably won't be able to do that in real time right now. Um, also, I'm like falling asleep again. So, um, anyway. If there's a definition, I will read it, and then we can discuss whether or not that's suitable. But like, sta stable before basically meant like <laughs> the exact binary of that spec is not changing, but we're not considering it all when doing future specs, which is like that doesn't help me. Any. So, so look, <laughs> folks, I, I'd rather us take a little extra time and get this right because in the community there's been a lot of frustration, and you know we don't want that. We want this to be done right. I mean, everybody wants this to be done right. We're not. Yeah. You should not rush this um, with respect to this. If, if there's reviews that need to occur, and we know there are reviews that need to occur, um, let's get those done before we go ahead and call this thing frozen. Um, yeah, I agree. That's why we're just trying to make sure that everyone's on the same page about frozen being a very big deal for the software folks well, and not. So, so just yeah, let's take two steps back, maybe. Let's take two steps back, maybe. Uh, Mark, you mentioned before that we have ISA and non-ISA. But actually, we're trying to subdivide the non-ISA into non-ISA, as in hardware, like debug, and software only, software conventions. Right. Uh, but given you're... that that's a different life cycle. Yeah, but you're not going to get away from the sign-offs. Yeah. Um, no. It... A lot of these not, specs that are probably most likely to be defined as software only specs are actually going to wind up having hardware implications in certain cases. Yeah. So we need to be really careful about that. Hey, 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 look, folks, I just want to tell everybody on the phone, part of the reason why you see these policies sitting here and why you see this discussion occurring is because we care about this. Okay. And we're not trying to be cavalier about this stuff. We're trying to go ahead and make it reproducible, make it well known so everybody knows what the rules of the game are. And we're trying to make sure that, you know, we have consistent buy-in inside of RVI because, um, you know, at times we have not. And that's the goal of this. So um, the definition of done is for people who don't know, that's the list of things that need to be done for each milestone. And, and so the definition of done uh, includes um, sign off. The sign off is required no matter what kind of document or specification it is. Um, and, and, you know, for example, security needs to sign off on everything. I'm sorry, they need to see it, right? And, and so, um, so even if the other timeline and, and, and roadway to get to ratification is simpler or easier for some kind of specs, um, we, we still need to do some basic stuff. Yeah, I think it's why it's very important that people don't throw around the word frozen unless it is actually frozen because it gets very confusing. Okay. Um, and I'll apologize in advance. Those documents are not small. Uh, so the ratification one is quite long. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's relatively new. We, nobody wrote down what it took to ratify until the summer when, when this thing was created. So, uh, so it's a relatively new document. 
if you find something that's wrong, help us make it better, please. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. This is a, like ISAs are a complicated process. It's just that we really need to know what it is that we are like meant to be looking at in order to have any shot at building something around it. So one thing to remember is we're also having that, that ongoing um, tagging here or ongoing pull from different sites. So, so some people need things to be done faster to avoid fragmentation uh, or to sum off fragmentation while, while on the other hand, we can't really uh, force things to be completed and need to take our time and go through the process and run it um, by everyone. Uh, and reviewing everything by security, for example, takes a lot of time. And also software has a lot of things to review these days. So um, that said, we, we're really trying to, to move forward as well and take fast track approaches, uh, simplify the software specifications uh, to avoid fragmentation occurring because some people just don't want to wait. And as we've seen with the, the, the page table uh, attributes, the, the page-based memory types, Go back to 0.7. Okay, uh, I think in, in the interest of time, let's move to the next topic. And just to summarize here, so from a uh, task group that worked on SBA specification, we consider it stable slash frozen, whatever you want to call it, because we don't expect any changes. But as soon as there is a process defined for software right, specification, sorry, but hang on, it's not stable or frozen or whatever you want to call it. We just talked about not throwing no, 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 the no. word frozen. I'm not throwing. That's what I'm saying. From saying well, from I did. <laughs> no, I just said. Okay, you guys I, keep not, I just said we are, we are we don't expect we don't expect any changes. But as soon as the process is defined, we'll go through the process, and uh, from RVI it will be called frozen or after the feedback, whatever happens. And uh, as as per my understanding, uh, on the RISC website also any frozen or ratified document will all be uploaded for everybody's. Uh, so that everybody can take a look into and SBA will also be included in there in a couple of months. I don't know when that will happen. But uh, let's move to the next topic uh, for ACPI. So there are uh, in the MC, there are some feedback that uh, whether the distros want ACPI or not. As for our initial feedback with the distros, they want ACPI. So that that's why uh, for the server, not for the base. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Did you skip to the next slide or are you on the same no, no, no. slide? I have the same slide. Just uh, okay. I'm talking about the ACPA specification. Okay. So uh, just wanted to clarify that uh, we had an initial call with uh, Red Hat and then they suggested that we should have ACPA for server platforms. Is that correct, Kumar? That's correct. Al, I think Al is on the call, right? So Al, uh, your feedback here with everybody on would be really appreciated, right? So we briefly spoke a couple of months back and the feedback that you had was for server specifically, uh, the boot process would be UEFI and the discovery process would be ACPI, right? So that's something that we had agreed on. And just wanted your feedback again with everything in the room. Yeah, I mean the basic rule is if you're going to run RHEL, you will you will provide UEFI, you will provide ACPI. The the closest it, the closer it looks to the SBBR and SBSA requirements, the better. That, that is still true. Okay. And then again, uh, just to expand on to that, th thanks a lot, Al. That's consistent with what we spoke earlier. And uh, if there is anybody, any other distro vendor in the room today in the meeting, please provide your feedback. Uh, yes, please yes. do not make me suffer through any of this crap anymore. I deal with this on Fedora, I deal with this on OpenSUSE, I deal with this on Magi, I deal with this on OpenMandriva. I don't want to deal with this with the Risk Five bring up. Please, for the love of all things good and sane, make it so I don't have to figure out how the bloody hardware works to start the computer. Okay, in which distro is this that you're representing? And, and also, uh, which direction is crap? Because people have different opinions on that one. Well done, Palmer. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I, I guess we might have misunderstood that and the, the, the real request was to bring device creep back is the only true solution. Yeah, J just I, please be specific. Uh, okay. <laughs> Somebody's getting a stake in the heart for that suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I still remember open firmware and it wasn't all faulty. I basic what my my basic ask is I, I generally don't actually care which way it is done whether it's ACPI or device tree or whatever but I want in the what I would love as a distro developer is that in the actual standard that it is burned into the board it is on the double e prom and I don't have to care about it and it cannot be updated so the onus is on the hardware vendor to make sure it works because okay, that's well, the problem with ARM and MIPS and everybody yeah. else. Now you're, you're gonna, gonna start gonna a whole nother yeah. argument. So sorry. You know what? I don't I, care. I, I will too. die on this hill. I will die on this hill. Like I'm not I, I, to. Because people have been like arguing about this, this for like, like at least ten years. Yeah, like the even on PCs, right, you're always gonna have the the ability to update those tables, right, with BIOS updates. So yes, but it's it not my responsibility. It is not my responsibility. I don't want to be responsible for that. I don't know anything about anything. Please don't make me have to think about it. No, I think, I think point taken, right? I think the whole idea here is that OS is completely agnostic to whatever the hell is happening in the, in the firmware and the BIOS, right? And that's the whole idea here that we're trying to achieve. Well, yeah. it, but, I, but I think part of Neil's point though, is that, um, we, 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 we insist on standards all over the place, right? And what the hardware vendors do is say, that's that's nice, we're gonna do whatever the hell we feel like doing. Um, that's just, that, that ain't gonna work, right? It's just, it makes life miserable for, for Neil, makes life miserable for Rel. Uh, no, don't do that. Um, <laughs> yes, you can update your firmware and please do. That would be really nice for a change. Um, but don't make that mean that I, as the distro developer, have to understand exactly what you have done in your hardware and how it works. It, okay. Well, this this issue that we're not going to solve it. It's not specific to Risk Five, right? This this happens with all the ISAs. So I, I don't. This is not something that I think we have the ability to solve. Well, and um, tradi here, traditionally, sorry. the way to solve this is solved is, is logo programs, right? It's finding ways to give the, the hardware right. vendors incentives to do the right thing. Yeah. Right. I assume we have a slide to argue about that one, though, too. So. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, there to always that is. so that's exactly what I wanted to discuss next is how do we make platform specifics and mandatory, or do you even need to? And how do we deal with logo branding so that a uh, so, vendor actually so, follows this? So first of all, Atish, let me stop you there because you got the, the, the branding wrong. It's risk five compatible with the OSA or for the OSA platform. It starts always with risk five compatible. Yeah, because that's what we trademarked. Um, and then four is the adornment. Four, um, and typically we use a profile or a platform name. Oh, uh, uh, that part I intentionally left because that's what is fixed, right? So that's a common prefix. What we worried about is the postfix. No, this is only the cost for very long email spread. So please always use it correctly because otherwise okay. your inbox will fill up quickly. Okay. So yeah. So so one comment also is that the the Risk Five platform specification, at least from the point of view of many of the upstream software projects will never be mandatory. There will always be boards or devices, whatever, that won't that won't align to that. It's, we see the same thing with ARM because a lot of embedded users won't won't care about the platform spec. They won't they won't care about PCI or whatever, so they won't put in PCI. Well, yeah, that's the magic of, of Risk Five. Not only do they not have to conform to that, they don't have to conform to the instructions, right? So they, they don't a... call themselves Risk Five. That's that's well, that simple. Well, they can't brand um, if they are, um, you know, non-conforming and compatible. Uh, but there's a lot of room for customization on top of the base, right? So that people do have the flexibility to do stuff 
will still be compatible. And you know, if you do anything above and beyond, obviously you're on your own. Uh, but 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 again, I mean, I I agree with what Paul just said. There's always going to be divergence. Um, you know, we we're just trying to make it as easy as possible to run the same in the end, run the same application from implementation to implementation. That's the end goal. It feels like you y'all don't want to say that not just the ISA, but like the way that the the hardware is configured shouldn't be. You, it's like you. I, it feels like you don't want to say that in order to call yourself a, a risk five system, you don't want to actually say. You don't want to prescribe that some minimum requirements on the hardware is necessary. You won't. And that is his flaw. I, I think I think it, contrary to that, actually, I yeah. mean, the whole purpose of the platform spec is to train it. So, so it doesn't seem like it. Mark, Mark, maybe maybe let me jump in and explain it a bit because um, actually we are seeing that if you want to grant yourself a Swiss five compatible, you have to have minimum requirements. But it depends what you do it for. Maybe we take two steps back and not just one, because all that we're doing with the platforms with OSA only matters to people who want to take a ready-made piece of software and run that on a piece of hardware and that want to go get their hardware and then get their software. So basically somebody buys Red Hat Enterprise Linux and wants to know whether it runs on the server that they're buying. So those are the only use cases where, where, where this branding really matters. And on the embedded side, we're more talking about source code compatibility. And there it's also about, I get the chip, or I want to design with that chip, and I have the software, those libraries. It, is the porting overhead going to be small? So the, this branding only works there. And then yes, we have this five compatible uh, with the with the base specification, with the platforms, with the, the ISA. Uh, again, that only matters to people who want to know what they are buying. And uh, unfortunately, the, the use cases are quite different for embedded uh, server desktop. And, and for that reason, there's, there's that flexibility. But I would also argue that you've got the same issue on the embedded system side, right? So there, there's there's essentially two classes of embedded systems, right? The one you're talking about where God only knows what they've done, right? And and only they know and, and nobody else is going to find out. But then there's also the, I need a subset of SUSE, Fedora, whatever it might be, and I, and I want to just run that. So you need standards for that as well, right? And, and part of the system ready project that ARM is working on, that's actually part of the, the environment that they're working for as well. Can't hear you, Philip. Philip, can I hear you? Hey, just, just for time check here. I'm not muted, yeah. sorry. So um, that, the problem is that is exactly OSA. So OSA has a base and has a service thing. And if you're targeting okay. automotive patent, you're probably always a base. Okay. Uh, or some future extension. Uh, we have M, which is source code compatibility for uh, embedded control. You're trying to port your motor controller to something else. Um, and and that, that's what we're trying to do. And that there's God knows what, if you're building a Bluetooth headset and nobody else is ever going to run software on it. You still have two minutes. That's not fair. <laughs> uh, I think we need uh, more discussion. Do you want? So, does the, everybody has time? Uh, can we move to a hack room after this? I unfortunately have a big meeting after this. So. Okay. Okay then. May, I don't so, know. Maybe we can find I, something else. I, I I've got my whole day free. I can I can sit here and argue with everyone as much as you want. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there is a platform HSC meeting coming up soon. So, so I would say we all reconvene in one of the many risk five meetings because pretty much everybody is going to be a member anyway. Well, I'm not, but like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can join it the risk five .org. Yeah, but it costs money, and I don't have no. any. No, it's no, free. No. It's, free. Individuals. it's free for individuals. 
Oh, okay. Well, then that changes things a little bit. Good. <laughs> okay. Any. <clears throat> So it just costs time to actually participate. Oh, that's easy. And it rubs you into a bunch of IP stuff, but that's all, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's less easy. Yeah. Okay, so any any conclusion? How do we make uh, vendors care about the specific platform specification? Well, I thought that uh, you guys were reaching out to all of the the major Linux distribution folks. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about review it, right? Yes, we, as per the last slide, we already have discussion with Canonical, Red Hat and Suze, uh, it's scheduled next week. No, but I'm worried about, uh, we'll get the feedback from the distros uh, and then the specification will be done. But uh, Palmer's concern was, what happens vendor, uh, platform vendors, not the uh, distros. Yeah, platform and, vendors and, uh, don't just care about the branding. You know, so my go worry on. was sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. My my worry was more broadly than a platform spec. Like the D one, like repurposes reserved bits of the supervisor spec, which is super scary on my end because then, like, if if that is still called Risk Five, like, what isn't? <laughs> hey, hey guys here. Hello. Right. Yeah, you mentioned the D1. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the D1, uh, we designed the DUI in the 2019, uh, two years ago. And at that time, we don't have any spec to follow, and there are no solution uh, for the non concurrency DMA. Yeah. And uh, we found a, a customer, a winner. He, 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 is, uh, he used to be a uh, uh, arm based SOC manufacturer, yeah. Uh, and all his driver is. Uh, is sorry, go, go. Is we're yeah, getting through from James there. So. Yeah, uh, you're going to get through to that here by me yeah. soon. You, you can yeah. take this to a hack room. We have plenty of hack rooms yeah. free. Sorry. It that won't be recorded, happen. but you can okay. take that. That's even better. <laughs> yeah, then I can see what I really feel. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Bye, guys. Okay, I think we can continue uh, this discussion on the mailing list or uh, please attend the platform working group meetings and then we continue discuss on this one. Okay. Thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you. Is uh, a standard SVPBMT, uh, how long we could uh, merge into the Unix? I mean, the standard uh, SVPBMT. I think Go will be kicked out in a, like 30 seconds. So. Right, it will. Yeah. Okay. Let's discuss in the mailing list. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. Do we have uh, Sahil? I made you presenter. If you have anything to upload uh, to share, you have to use the plus button on the bottom left. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to uh, plus what the plus button where. If you look at the oh, lowest on the left, there's a plus button. If you click on that, it takes you to something that says manage presentations. And in that screen, you can upload anything you want for the boss. Uh, so just where do I choose the presentation from? Like if I have something on my local machine? Uh, yeah, any PDF file on the local machine can be uploaded. Or you can try a screen share. It's been working with most browsers, but there are a few browsers that don't like it. Okay. Yeah, I found uh, a link to uh, upload my local presentation. I'll try that. Okay, and if you want to unmute your video as well, so people can actually okay. see you. Uh, yes. Okay, we've got the presentation. Great. Thank you. So I'll just give a couple of minutes. I don't know if everyone who wanted to attend this is there yet, uh, but this is a follow-up to uh, uh, yesterday's uh, presentation on user interrupts. And there was a bunch of interest on uh, doing a follow-up, uh, going through the hardware architecture and how, how user interrupts works underneath. So today, at least I'm planning to uh, go through like a quick preview of what we discussed yesterday, like, uh, 
a couple of minutes or five minutes and then uh, deep dive into uh, how user interrupts are implemented uh, at the hardware level and then we can discuss any opens any questions and uh, i am hoping this to be an interactive session and so feel free to uh, uh, like uh, uh, in interrupt me or like ask any questions uh, i'll try to answer them uh, if they posted on the chat okay so let's get started uh, uh, So user interrupts, uh, at least uh, what we discussed yesterday was user interrupts is really a really fast way to signal. Uh, so today, uh, like uh, today, all the uh, all the communication, like interprocess communication, I/O event delivery, they all happen through the kernel. The idea with user interrupts is deliver events directly to user space, so bypass the kernel and pretty much reach directly to the user and. Uh, uh, this helps reduce latency, uh, it's super fast and it's efficient. Um, this feature is coming up in Sapphire Rapids on an x86 processor called Sapphire Rapids from Intel. Mm -hmm. And uh, overall, there are, there, are, there are multiple sources of user interrupts that can uh, come, uh, like that can generate interrupts. One of them uh, is a user to user IPC. It's called Send UIPI which uh, allows uh, one, one application in user mode to send an API to another application running in uh, a user space to, uh, without any intervention from the kernel. So you just execute an instruction and you pretty much receive uh, a notification on the, uh, on the other process. And uh, there are other forms of um, uh, uh, user interrupts. Like one is where you could have a kernel source generate an interrupt uh, that gets delivered to the user directly. The patches for this are still in development, uh, uh, but that is also possible with the Sapphire Rapids platform that I discussed. Now, in future, we envision to have other sources of interrupts like devices or any other external source that could generate an interrupt and it gets directly delivered to the uh, application. This technology is uh, still being defined and it could come up in the future, sometime in the future. So let me take a pause here and ask if there are any questions or if people have any uh, uh, any interest in uh, what comes next, or otherwise I can go ahead with the plan that I mentioned. Okay, uh, I'm checking if there are questions on the chat. Uh, if not, then I can go ahead with how uh, how user interrupts are implemented on the hardware side. So uh, for user interrupts, these are, uh, I, I'll try to go through the hardware architecture and what are the basic uh, uh, architectural features uh, which the OS needs to take care of, right? And so one is the, X, uh, like there are a bunch of new x86 instructions. The one that I discussed earlier was send you API. Uh, this is a user space instruction. Uh, it takes in a parameter. Uh, I'll go into the details of what this parameter is later, uh, but it pretty much allows you to generate an interrupt on one uh, process and send uh, generate a notification from one process and it gets delivered to the other one. UI ret, it's a user interrupt return uh, handler. What this does is uh, it, it allows, say if you have similar to signal handlers, if you have a user interrupt uh, uh, that gets uh, generated, um, so let me actually share the the sample that we went over yesterday. And so over here, this sample, what it does is uh, you have a user interrupt handler. This is similar to a signal handler that would be called whenever you have uh, a user interrupt delivered to the application. And so as part of this user interrupt handler, uh, you have this interrupt attribute that is recognized by GCC 11. Uh, and so as part of this attribute, uh, GCC saves all the registers that you need to save, uh, like all the, all the uh, general purpose registers. And then when you're done processing the interrupt handler, you call UI ret, 
uh, which is also automatically inserted by GCC. So applications don't need to worry about it. And uh, when you call UI Rep, uh, the control would return back to where uh, the application was interrupted. And so uh, you can just continue executing uh, where you were previously. So this is, um, this is the send UIPI instruction that I was talking about. This allows you to send the interrupt. Then there are a bunch of instructions called, uh, which help you manipulate the UIF flag. The UIF flag is uh, called the user interrupt flag, uh, and it lets you enable and disable interrupts or test whether interrupts are enabled or disabled. And so the instructions for it are similar to the x86 uh, CLI STI instructions. It's HTUI and CLUI and test UI, which uh, allow you to disable interrupts uh, as a uh, so let's say if you are running some critical section if this application wants to run some critical section and it doesn't want to get interrupted um, it would call uh, CLUI and uh, once it's done processing the critical section it would call STUI and then it would go ahead uh, continue uh, it would that would enable interrupts and it can uh, get these interrupts delivered at a later point. So these are the x86 instructions. Uh, uh, any questions here? The next thing I'm planning to talk about is the, uh, uh, so actually there are a couple of, uh, there's one question over here. Oh, actually there are a couple of questions. Uh, so one question from Jason is, is there any standardization work we can see for other sources? So, uh, um, so the, for, this, for the source of interrupts right now, uh, we're thinking it could be uh, devices, but uh, we haven't like uh, narrowed down uh, what exactly how it would look like. And so it, it would still take uh, some time for us to uh, put out something publicly. Uh, but on, on the receiver side, we think they would still uh, look the same. So the receiver infrastructure is all common. And uh, uh, the way applications receive interrupts uh, wouldn't change uh, with what the source of interrupts is. And uh, at the software side, uh, what we were thinking is we would have an FT uh, that the receiver would create uh, as part of uh, registration, registering itself as a receiver. So when you create, a, uh, when you register yourself, you create an FT. And now you use this FD as an authentication mechanism for anyone to generate an interrupt to you. And so that would mean you can send this FD to another user space task. You could uh, possibly send it to a kernel agent like IOU ring, or you could send it to a device driver and then it can do the plumbing underneath uh, uh, to get connected to the uh, so actually the uh, uh, device driver itself wouldn't have to do the plumbing, but we would have some in kernel API that would do the plumbing for the device driver. And the, uh, so the device would just try to connect to that and then eventually interrupts would be uh, delivered to, uh, uh, to the application. Does that, uh, I know it doesn't answer your question fully, but uh, would you, do you have any other questions, Jason? I would take it as a no. Uh, so one question from uh, John is uh, uh, how the CPU knows the right processes and uh, running in order to deliver them. Yeah, uh, so that uh, I would go over that. Uh, we would, uh, I, I would go through the step where uh, from the exact point, the send UIPI instruction gets executed to the point uh, the interrupt gets delivered and how, uh, uh, what things get updated and how we get the interrupt delivered. Uh, so there is a question from Kim about, have you considered adding support to an existing IPC call and putting the user interrupt instructions in VDSO? Um, so we haven't looked at VDSO, but we did look at uh, uh, considering uh, an existing IPC system call. Uh, I forgot to say, uh, so if you, if you can download the slides, then you, you should be able to see this link where I've discussed uh, Uh, where it, it is the first RFC patches that I've sent out. Uh, 
uh, uh, probably last week. And so, so this is where you can see, like, uh, I tried to compare it with signals and event FT, uh, and we're just trying to see if we can fit this in. The main issue with fitting it with existing mechanisms was uh, that these these uh, user interrupts depend on the hardware and fitting like hardware uh, having a hardware abstraction and having a purely OS abstraction together was turning out to be a little bit complicated. Uh, and uh, so I have listed the reasons why we didn't do it, but overall it was just, uh, it would be confusing for the user uh, who's already used to some sort of, uh, guarantees from the existing IP, IPC mechanism to uh, use uh, to use user interrupt FT in that direction. Uh, another question from Claudio is, uh, uh, in case of x86, can a task interrupt any other task? Uh, so in case of denial of service. I do talk about denial of service in the RPC as well. Um, and so, uh, the, the permission to interrupt a task is given by the receiver. So idea here is uh, if the receiver should share this only with trusted uh, processes, like uh, you can't use this, uh, you can't share the user interrupt FT, or I wouldn't recommend sharing the user interrupt FT uh, with a, uh, with a device, uh, with a, sorry. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't uh, recommend sharing a user interrupt FT with a task that you wouldn't trust because uh, denial of service is definitely possible. Maybe one task might not be able to do it, but if you have like uh, that same task that does uh, multiple, uh, like it does a multiple copy of this uh, FD and it, it tries, all of them try to send uh, interrupts at the same time, I'm, uh, uh, it would be possible to do a denial of service. And so this is only between uh, processes, uh, between tasks that are of the same address space, so within the same process or uh, across processes where you really trust the, ta trust the task. Yeah. Okay, um, so the next, uh, so the next one I have is these are, uh, so uh, this is how the hardware uh, relates to the state of the task, right? So this is what connects with a user space task to how hardware sees it. So these are a bunch of MSRs, uh, six namely, and uh, they store the state. Uh, so this is what the hardware would refer uh, when a particular task is running about seeing where uh, to, to store the task for that, to store the interrupts for the task, to have the handler address stored for the task. If there is, if the task has requested for a stack, stack adjustment, then what, how much should the stack be adjusted? Do we need an alternate stack? And that's where uh, we would put this, uh, put the, the kernel would put the information here. Uh, UPID, these are the pointers to the UPID, UPID and UITT structs. I would discuss them in the next slide. But uh, all of these are per thread task and they would, the kernel would save them as part of context switch. So each task would have its own set of uh, values for these MSRs and the kernel would save and restore them uh, at every context switch the task goes through. And over here, the handler uh, uh, and all of that are specific to that specific uh, same task. So uh, right now, the way we've designed it in uh, the first RFC is these are all unique to each task. So when you ha even if you have tasks of the same process, uh, all of these values wouldn't carry forward to the other process uh, to the other task. Um, they would they would need to be like that task would have to register itself, register a handler for itself, and register uh, different addresses to get this uh, to get these populated. So now these this is the main crux of the uh, uh, the user interrupt delivery, right? And there are two main ta uh, architectural structures that we have. Both of these are in memory structures. Uh, they they would be allocated by the kernel. One is called the UPID. This is the user posted interrupt descriptor. What this stores is this stores uh, uh, this stores uh, what pending interrupts are there. Uh, what is an uh, what is the existing notification state and the routing information. So before we go here, let me let me back uh, uh, let me describe how this overall instructions work. So send UIPI overall is a uh, is a 
posted instruction. So it's an it's really an asynchronous instruction where a sender it executes send UIPI and uh, and then it can uh, go on continuing. So this instruction wouldn't block and you would continue doing uh, something uh, whatever you want after this. Now the interrupt interrupt delivery would happen uh, could happen uh, immediately if the receiving task is running on another CPU. If the task is not running, then uh, uh, the interrupt delivery would happen at a later time. And even if the task is running, it could have interrupts disabled uh, using the CLI a CLUI instruction that I mentioned. And so still the interrupt wouldn't be uh, delivered at that time. And so this is truly a posted mechanism where you post the interrupt uh, and the receiver receives it at a different time. Uh, and in, uh, and so these are the structures uh, that are used for that. And so when you actually execute send you API instruction, what the hardware does, uh, what the instruction does it, it ups, updates a bit in this memory structure to say that, okay, this is the interrupt that I need to deliver. Uh, it's, a, it's a memory structure. And so um, uh, this would be able to be seen by the receiver as well uh, when we context switch the receiver back. And so now uh, it's it saved this in memory and now it tries, uh, there is a bit called the SN bit and the ON bit. These two bits signify whether uh, there is an ongoing notification for this task or if the task is context switched out and we are suppressing notifications at this point. So after saving uh, the interrupt vector or after saving the interrupt in this bit, uh, in this 64-bit uh, uh, memory space it would the hardware would check the sn and the on bit and see whether an actual interrupt needs to be generated for the receiver now uh, let's say uh, let's assume the case where the sn is zero so we are not suppressing notification and we want to deliver an interrupt so what we would do is in that case then uh, generate uh, uh, so what what this upit structure also holds is where this task is currently running so it would hold the CPU, uh, uh, the, the physical destination. Uh, this, uh, right now, this is x86 specific. So it would hold the x86 uh, specific destination CPU uh, uh, in the UPID structure. And this structure would be updated every time the task context switches. So now you say if you have, you have a process running on CPU zero and it moves to CPU one. Uh, during context switch, the kernel would update that structure uh, and so this routing information is updated in the UPID structure. And so anytime a sender executes send you API, uh, it would uh, refer this, uh, uh, this, the hardware would do this automatically, like uh, the application doesn't need to do it, but it would refer the routing information and it would send the physical API uh, to this, to the CPU that was actually running, that was running the task, uh, that was the intended receiver. Now, uh, and now, so how does the sender do this, right? This is, uh, the UPID is a receiver side structure, which is uh, updated by the sender and referenced by the receiver. And now uh, you have another structure called the UITT. The UITT is a sender side structure. And so the MSR that I had talked about, the uh, I32 UITT MSR, it points to the user interrupt target table. Uh, and this table holds a bunch. Uh, so every time a sender registers itself as a sender, uh, it would uh, get a new entry added to this table. And each of these entries point to a specific receiver and a specific vector within that receiver. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, 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 the, my uh, presentation tool uh, misrouted this, but this is actually supposed to go from here. It is goes through, uh, supposed to go through interrupt vector Y and it's supposed to reach uh, receiver task A, U today. Um, and so what this does is uh, you have a send UIPI instruction. Uh, so now let's say the sender executed send UIPI uh, two. So if it executes send UIPI two, the hardware would refer the UITT entry UITT entry would have the UPID pointer for the receiver task. So it would look at the SN, ON bit, the routing information, and then generate a physical interrupt that would uh, eventually uh, be routed and uh, delivered to the CPU that was running task A. Now over here, uh, the CPU, uh, based on uh, the MSRs that we have programmed, it would recognize that this is a user interrupt. And so instead of generating a kernel interrupt, it would deliver uh, 
the interrupt to the user and so it would use load the handler address that we had programmed and it would deliver the interrupt to the user so that is pretty much how the send uip instruction works i have another slide to uh, talk about how the interrupt delivery happens on the receiver side but this is how we uh, uh, the send uip uh, on the, from the sender side this is how we send the interrupt uh, to the receiver and now on the receiver side i can talk about how we deliver the interrupt on the receiver but any questions here uh, i know i went over this uh, pretty quickly uh, since we just have a half an hour slot feel free to speak on the mic or post your questions uh, over chat I think someone Lorenzo is typing. I'm waiting to see what he's typing. Uh, uh, if not, then I would go to the next slide. So the question is, uh, when is the IRQ delivered if the receiver task is not running? So if the receiver task is not running, uh, then the IRQ would be delivered uh, when the task gets scheduled back. Now it depends on why the task was scheduled out. Uh, say if the task got scheduled out just because it ran out of its time quota, uh, uh, it ran out of its time quota uh, because of the uh, because it ran for a long time and the scheduler just uh, switched it out. Then it would have to wait its turn, and when it gets scheduled back, uh, the kernel would look at whether there are any pending interrupts in the UPID structure, and then it would uh, uh, deliver. Uh, then it would. So right now we do a self IPI, but there are other mechanisms to trigger a user interrupt as well. And so the kernel would pretty much uh, uh, update the structures and when the task becomes running again, so when it moves to string three, it would get the uh, IRP delivered. Now, let's say the task was blocked in the kernel. Uh, uh, it, did, uh, uh, it did a blocking system call and it was blocked in the kernel. Then what we would do is, uh, uh, the idea is the kernel would actually uh, uh, interrupt the blocking syscall. Uh, and so the blocking system call would get interrupted. The task would receive an e-inter similar to a signal handler. And uh, we would deliver the user interrupt uh, notification at that point. Uh, I do have an open over here where uh, we're not sure whether we want to interrupt every blocking syscall or do we want to have a special syscall uh, that just blocks for user interrupts. Right now in the RFC, I have a user interrupt wait system call that allows an application to block and wait for user interrupts. But uh, like if you want to have a behavior similar to signals where uh, uh, like a sleep or a read or a e-poll, you want to break out of a e-poll, then uh, we would uh, use, uh, we would have to do additional plumbing, but it is definitely possible architecture hardware wise. Thanks. Thanks, James. Yeah, that's all. Um, so the question from uh, Jason is, uh, is the IRQ delivered to a single thread or any thread in a process? So uh, the way it is designed right now, it would be delivered to the thread uh, that, uh, uh, to the thread that uh, uh, created the FT. Now, uh, uh, it, since this is hardware MSRs, uh, it would be very tricky to figure out uh, like the hardware for the hardware to figure out which threads are running and out of the process and uh, be, be able to deliver it to a particular thread that is actually running, right? And so over here, the idea is it's, it's mainly for a point-to-point -point communication between uh, threads where one thread generates a send UIP and it's targeted for a specific thread and only that thread uh, would be able to receive that uh, intra. I've described, uh, uh, so if you look at the RFC, I've described how uh, this compares with signal handlers and why we couldn't expand signal handlers. And one of the reasons is signal, uh, signal delivery is process directed, where any, process, any thread in a process could be running and it could, it could receive the uh, interrupt. But this is uh, user interrupts uh, in its current form is uh, single threaded where you have to, uh, you have to have the thread running that is targeted for. 
now this is the uh, second part where uh, uh, where we talk about how user interrupt delivery works so remember i talked about how the sender task executes send you api to uh, so the first step we do is it update the upid so at the sender side we update the upid the second step that happens is generate the notification vector uh, interrupt and this would happen depending on when the receive whether the receiver is running or not and that is updated by the kernel uh, into the upid struct and so if the receiver is running we generate a notification interrupt uh, when this notification interrupt gets delivered on the receiving cpu we recognize the interrupt uh, as a user interrupt move the uh, move the uh, pending interrupt from the memory structure to the hardware msi so this is where we actually detect the interrupt right because up till now the interrupt was only posted on in a memory descriptor and now we move it to a uh, interrupt descript uh, move it actually to the msr and this is where we detect the interrupt and now the delivery of the interrupt happens if the application has enabled in, uh, interrupts right so if it has executed xtui then we would uh, push the push the vector onto the stack Uh, the vector that was created uh, generated as uh, registered as part of the ft creation we push it onto the stack this helps the application recognize which sender is it receiving this event from so uh, we have uh, 64 vectors and this is the vector that it is receiving uh, based on this vector it can determine which is the sender that sent it and then it invokes the handler and uh, so this is how the handler invocation works right where you have uh, the uirr and you move it to uh, from the uirr you call the handler uh, the handler address is stored in the i32 handler msr uh, so the hardware uh, switches to uh, the handler msr uh, to the address pointed by the handler msr and then you have the vector that is delivered to the hardware and then uh, by the hardware to the application and then it does a ui write and you return from uh given for written from this sysco so that's all that i had i know the time is up uh, is there of uh, is there someone else following this or uh, can we hang on over here uh, for a few minutes if people want to continue here yeah technically there's nobody following the keynote is uh in 30 minutes so we can have another 10 to 15 minutes if you really want okay uh i don't know i don't have much to present i just wanted to give time for questions if people have questions then we might continue otherwise uh, we can call it a uh, session so if people do have questions we'll get through them faster if they actually ask over audio yeah i was hoping that too but uh, it's like a shy audience they prefer to ask it through a uh, chat Yeah I don't have anything after this this is all that I wanted to discuss about how uh, the interrupts get delivered uh I had to go through this quickly so please feel free to ask questions if you have uh or you can go through if you uh, want to read up then you can read up the patches that I have and in that I have links for the github repo where these patches are stored and we have additional samples and tests that um, run on this there is also a link to the hardware specification and you can always uh, reach out to me uh, uh, at the email address uh, uh, and the email address is also there in the slide and it is also there uh, uh, in the patch series so i see lorenzo typing and so i'll just wait uh, if he wants a question uh, okay uh he want he'll probably reach out offline so i don't think we have much thanks james uh, for letting me uh continue for a few minutes that's all that i have okay you're welcome and uh, thanks for coming and i suppose i should change the slide to thank all sponsors if you want to stay on for that That didn't work.
Okay, so we begin thanking the sponsors with Facebook, the diamond sponsor. Um, and we move on to IBM as the platinum sponsor, who I work for. Um, we have two gold sponsors, which are ARM and Microsoft. Um, and we have three silver sponsors, AWS, Amazon, Netflix, and Red Hat. Um, the speaker gift you got, which I should have, but I forgot, the little FIDO2 token was provided by Collabora. Um, and VMware will provide the t-shirts, assuming you're lucky enough to be one of the first 200 people who fills in the survey that will be presented at the keynote. And after that, oh, and the Linux Foundation, who provided conference services to us. And uh, just a reminder of the anti-harassment policy, which you've been reminded about um, quite a lot now. If there are any concerns about execution or uh, the way people are reacting on this chat or the video or anything, please either send an email to contact at funnixplumbersconf.org or to join the moderator's room on the matrix chat to raise the concern. Email will be anonymous. Obviously, the moderator's room is visible to anybody who joins it. And with that, I suppose I should just remind you um, that there will be a keynote in 25 minutes. Uh, that's going to be at uh, 1900 UTC, if I've got my time conversions correct. And so we hope to see you all there. Thanks very much, everybody. See you in about 25 minutes.